Good morning, everybody. I, I know we're going to have a trickle of people continue to come in, um, as is the standard for Zoom meetings, and I think the standard for Saturday mornings as well. I hope everybody has, you know, some bad coffee and a Danish or some other pastry just to complete the conference at home kind of experience. Um, my name is James Hudspeth. I'm an internist at Boston University, and I'm one of the two co-chairs for the Education Committee. And I have my co-host with me. Great. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tracy Raven, and I'm an internist and pediatrician at Yale University in Connecticut. It's and co-chair of the Education Committee. It's wonderful to see so many people here on a Saturday morning. So, um, so just to start us off, um, I, I'm imagining that that folks who are on the call know a little bit about CUGH, but just to give a little background on sort of CUGH and the Education Committee. Um, Consortium of Universities for Global Health was founded um, back in 2008. Um, and shortly thereafter, there was a merger uh, with the Global Health Education Consortium, which was a separate organization that had been focused specifically on global health education for a number of years. Um, and the Education Committee of CUGH is sort of what became of uh, GHEC. Um, and then added some additional folks to it. And so we, um, as, as we are often told, we are sort of the largest and most active committee of CUGH. Um, you will hear about our um, various subcommittees and working groups shortly, um, but we have just a, a, a wonderfully um, diverse and large uh, number of folks who are CUGH members who have volunteered their time um, to, uh, to participate in these various um, subcommittees and, and working groups that we have in the education committee. So we're hoping that by sharing some information about those groups and what they're doing this morning, um, that folks who are not currently involved may be motivated or interested in, in getting involved and, um, and adding to, um, uh, to what we're all doing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, that notion that, um, you know, that while you're going to hear about some awesome projects and some very large projects that a number of people here have worked on, uh, the idea that all of this is accessible to people who are members of CUGH and that really this is, you know, this is our organization. Um, all of us on the committees started off, you know, I, I remember I started almost eight years ago, nine years ago, uh, just doing some initial presentations at conferences like this. So, so it really is a place where people can find projects to join, uh, work on larger things across, you know, that cut across institutions, cut across countries, uh, cut across disciplines, and um, I think really find um, inspiration as well as a lot of support. Um, while we kind of run, run up the clock slightly as we let a few more people in, I just wanted to put up the faces of the people who helped organize this event. So we have from left to right, um, Barbara Kemholtz, uh, Tracy, of course, Virginia Rothorn as well, who I believe is on this call, and then myself. Um, this was the sort of committee or group that helped organize things. All right, uh, so this is going to be the schedule for the day. Um, we are going to first hear some updates from our subcommittees uh, via video. We're going to have hot topic presentations after that. So those will be sort of 10 minute presentations dealing with a uh, recent innovation or early stage project um, or something that is kind of hot in the, the topic of global health education. We're gonna have a Q and A with some of the speakers. Uh, we'll have a very brief break, and I will kind of apologize in advance. The the breaks in this schedule we realize are are few. Uh, the time is obviously pretty crunched. We have three hours, and it felt um, hard to say we're gonna give up too much of that time when we have so many people we would like you guys to hear from. After that, we're gonna have roundtable discussions. These are going to be small groups, so people will be placed into breakout rooms. There will be opportunities to either go with some of the subcommittees you'll hear about, so kind of hear about what kind of work they're doing, um, help them think through some present questions they're facing, or to go with hot topic presenters uh, and to build upon their presentation, hear more about the next steps that they're thinking about. We'll have a brief report back and we'll kind of give people instructions about that. And then we'll finish with a discussion of the STAR project that UGH and other um, partners were involved with uh, that pertains a lot to global health education and is a really interesting project that I think people enjoy hearing about. Um, I'll put this program into the minute uh, into the chat in a second. Um, you know, a brief note for virtual conferences. This is, I think, for many of us, probably amongst the earlier virtual conferences. This is my actual my first virtual conference. I know all of us have probably been doing a lot of virtual education, so we're trying to bring in some of those principles. Um, we will be playing with things a little bit, so you know, I, I think after the fact, we'd love to get feedback from people as to what worked and what we could change or tweak in the future. Um, 
we want to try to make sure this is interactive. I think the notion of sitting there for three hours watching videos, you know, is not anybody's idea of a good time. Um, so I, towards the interactivity, we have the small group sessions that will be a space where people can talk and really kind of get deeply interactive. Even during the recorded presentations, however, we are going to encourage you as participants to use the chat function and place questions or comments into there as we go forward. And in turn, for recorded sessions, we're actually going to ask the speakers to be monitoring the chat and to be responding to questions as well. And we ask um, them to use the at you know, name of person asking a question uh, when they use their chats, just so it's evident who they're responding to, what question they're trying to tackle. During the formal Q&A parts of the schedule, we will spotlight a few of the questions that we think are the most interesting or uh, the most engaging, and then ask the uh, speakers to unmute themselves and expand upon things a little bit. Um, and I think that is about it. So with that, um, we will now shift into the, the subcommittee updates. Um, I will be kind of just flipping back and forth between videos a little bit for this, so bear with me. And uh, yeah, and welcome everybody. We're really excited for the day and we're looking forward to having you with us. Can you hear the audio for this? Greetings everyone and good day from San Jose, Costa Rica, where I live and work. My name is Carlos Alberto Fairon Guzman and I had the chair of the competency subcommittee at UGH. This competency subcommittee is co-chaired by Dr. Barb Assel, who works at Trinity Western University. She sends her warmest regards. Our competency subcommittee is made up of 21 members that represent eight different countries. Uh, we also have the representation within those countries of four WHO health regions. And in our uh, subcommittee, we have the participation of two training advisory committee members we've been, that will be rotating off during this conference. Part of what we accomplished during 2021 was the development of a survey that will be rolled out this year. The survey seeks to better understand the utilization of the second edition of the competency toolkit that was launched in 2018 by this subcommittee. We also successfully finished the faculty development workshop on global health experiential learning this past February, in which we had the participation of subcommittee members and former members. This was the first time that this uh, workshop was done in a virtual environment. We also finalized our two-year uh, uh, agenda for this subcommittee after we did some uh, conversations and survey with the members, and we are continuously advancing the planetary health education framework it's a, that is a collaboration between the Planetary Health Alliance and this subcommittee that will be launched uh, during this conference. So stay tuned and look for the Planetary Health session. And it, it will also be a further uh, detail during the PHA Planetary Health Alliance annual conference in April. Finally, some of the goals for this 2021 entail the work that we've been or launching the, 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 the work that we've been doing with the planetary health education framework. As well, we will we have put together two different task force to review the competency framework as it is right now and, and assess it in relation to the anti-racist and decolonization paradigms that have been emerging and plan to uh, do subsequent modifications if needed uh, with these emerging findings. Finally, we would work on finalizing the enrolling out the competency toolkit survey and then uh, uh, mapping a way forward uh, to improve the CUGH competency toolkit. So with that, I hope that that was a useful uh, overview of what, the work that we do here at the uh, competency subcommittee. It's been a pleasure. Bye. Greetings, everyone, oh, and sorry. good day from San Jose, Costa Rica, where I live and work. My name is Carlos Alberto Fairon Guzman, and I had the chair. Okay. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, let me just get the next one up. This is the 2020 report from the CUGH Subcommittee on Master's and Undergraduate Degrees in Global Health, which is better known by the acronym SMUDGE.
Global health education occurs at the undergraduate, master's, and doctoral levels. Our committee focuses on non-clinical education, including both classroom-based multidisciplinary education and global health that emphasizes principles such as globalization and health equity, and experiential learning that occurs through engagement outside the classroom. One of the ways that we have accomplished this mission is through research that explores and characterizes the global health education landscape. We published two empirical analyses of global health education at the undergraduate level, demonstrating the undergraduate education in global and public health is now offered at diverse types of colleges and universities in classifying the curricular models used by current global health minor programs. The paper on global health minors also introduces the 10 CUGH recommended student learning objectives in global health. These are meant to complement the existing CUGH recommended competencies for interprofessional global health practice. Smudge working groups have also published several articles about master's education in North America, including one that focused on the competencies used by MPH, Masters in Public Health Concentrations in Global Health, and one on the curricula in use by Masters in Science and Masters in Arts, MA and MS programs. Full citations and links to all of our articles are available on the Smudge page on the CUGH.org website. Smudge has also contributed expertise to two professional development workshops for global health educators. One is the Teach Global Health Summer Institute. Prior Teach Global Health sessions included more than 120 participants from 85 institutions in eight countries. The summer 2021 workshop will be offered online in June and applications are still being accepted. Smudge also supported in partnership with the CUGH Competencies Working Group, two week long workshops in Costa Rica that focused on experiential learning and a 2021 version that was hosted online. Smudge is in the process of developing a series of brief guidance documents for global health educators. These include one page handouts on faculty resources for student advising in global health, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary themes for global health courses, best practices for local, international, and virtual experiential learning opportunities, and the CUGH recommended student learning objectives in global health. These resources will be posted on the CUGH website in the near future. Please visit the Smudge website or email us if you have any questions about undergraduate or master's education in global health. We also invite you to join our roundtable later in this workshop. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Carol and Catherine for that. So next up, uh, we are going to be hearing from the Global Health Program Advisory Subcommittee. Hi, and welcome to the Global Health Program Advisory Subcommittee Update Program at the Education Committee Satellite Session uh, for this meeting at CUGH in March 2021. And thank you for joining. It's obviously a different context this year being virtual. So GHPAS has had a change of leadership in early fall, bringing in two co-chairs who are new to CUGH. Teresa Mackay, who is an MBA in engineering, and Barbara Kamholtz, and I am a geriatric psychiatrist. At the same time, the subcommittee's role has been undergoing reevaluation as to mission. We have engaged in several discussions regarding the nature of ongoing mentor-mentee relationships, principal among them being why the requests for GHPAS services have decreased over time to just three during the current cohort. In this context, there have been broader discussions about the focus for this type of mentoring. We have decided to include to GHPAS's 
original mission of, uh, as I said, developing global health programs in high income countries to the provision of mentoring for academic programs in low and middle income countries. Therefore, we have renamed the subcommittee the Academic Program Advisory Subcommittee, or APAS. Fortunately, we already have a project for the new APAS, and it started in February of 2021. This is a collaboration with the Workforce and Capacity Building Education Subcommittees to develop geriatric. Welcome to the Global Health Program Advisory Subcommittee. Oh, technical difficulty. Let's see. Here we go. February of 2021. This is a collaboration with the Workforce and Capacity Building Education Subcommittees to develop geriatric and mental health capability for nursing at Kathmandu University Department of Nursing, cited at the hospital of Kathmandu University, Dulakel Hospital in Dulakel, Nepal. And we look forward to seeing how our new format will uh, engage productively with Kathmandu University. Thank you so much for attending this session. Great. Thanks so much, Barbara. And next up, we are going to hear from our uh, trainee advisory subcommittee. Hi, my name is Priscilla August, and I'm the chair of the trainee advisory committee. My name is Deepika Kana, and I'm the chair elect. So I want to briefly start off by telling you exactly what the Training Advisory Committee is. So we're essentially a student-run committee in CUGH, and we provide the voice of students to CUGH. And this is in alongside our subcommittee, which runs the Campus Representative Program, which basically... Hi, my name is Priscilla August, and I'm the chair of the Training Advisory Committee. My name is Deepika Kana, and I'm the chair-elect. So I want to briefly start off by telling you exactly what the Training Advisory Committee is. So we're essentially a student-run committee in CUGH, and we provide the voice of students to CUGH. And this is in alongside our subcommittee, which runs the Campus Representative Program, which basically helps us to get connected with institutions where the students are. So here is a, the way in which we kind of orient the work that we do is through three main goals. And so I'm going to use these to actually talk about briefly some of the accomplishments that we've done So for this past year. So the one of the goals that we have is strengthening TAC and its engagement in CGH activities. And we've done that through various projects with the campus rep representative program, as well as through our research study that is currently ongoing. And you'll hear more about that in the hot topic section of this, this uh, satellite. We've also been working on a goal of increasing student training diversity and global health in terms of ethnicity, academia, and gender. And we've done that through um, our application processes. And we've even started a new workshop that is geared towards, general geared to everyone, but we're mainly really trying to reach uh, students from all over the world, especially those who are underrepresented. And finally, we've been working on various advocacy issues, trying to really get students more involved in this. And so we've been writing a lot of white papers, putting out webinars, and also even having some events at this at the conferences, such as the one that's coming up. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Deepika, who's gonna be talking about our goals for the next coming year. So looking, uh, looking forward to the upcoming year, we also are going to orient ourselves around our three main goals, which are to strengthen tech engagement, promote quote, global health, ethnic, gender, and academic diversity, and prioritize global advocacy. Um, so we want to continue a lot of the things that we've been doing in the past in order to build on these goals. We want to continue collaborating within the CUGH network, as well as increase our connections with international um, and uh, global health student organizations. Uh, and in terms of uh, continuing to promote diversity, we want to keep tracking our demographic metrics and make sure that we're being as inclusive and representative as possible. Um, and then in terms of prioritizing uh, global advocacy, we want to continue disseminating information and also use the data that we're collecting now to really figure out which advocacy issues are important to students right now and use that to inform our future projects. 
So um, that's, a, that's a bit of a snapshot shot into what uh, TAC looks like and the Campus Reps program looks like. If you do have any questions about either of those, please feel free to ask during the Q&A. You can follow our social media accounts here. And if you are attending the conference, please feel free to stop by our booth for more information. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Priscilla and Deepka, for that. Um, okay, next up, we are going to hear from our workforce subcommittee. I'm Nancy Reynolds. Um, I'm Angela Chang with the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing Center for Global Initiatives. I will be providing administrative support to the workforce subcommittee. Hi, I'm Suraj Batrai. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, share with you some some success that we our subcommittee had in the past one year. Um, so, so, for example, we uh, invited uh, distinguished guests to our, to our um, monthly meetings uh, to discuss uh, various uh, issues and opportunities with the global health workforce. And this year, uh, sorry, the last year we focused on nursing workforce because uh, the, the WSO declared the year as the year of nurse and midwife. Uh, we, we collaborated with the capacity building subcommittee to discuss various uh, areas of uh, training um, and, and capacity strengthening around uh, cervical cancer screening, and geriatric mental health. Uh, we're also in the process to write a grant jointly uh, we initiated a discussion on uh, leadership program, uh, especially focused to nurses, but can be uh, for uh, a wide um, career of health workforce. So, um, and we discussed the uh, white papers that the training advisory committee um, came up with. Um, and this, those papers are mainly around the, uh, the education of minorities and the student debt um, issues that the the student the undergrad students have. Uh, likewise, we submitted a panel session for the CBGS conference this year, and the topic for this uh, panel is uh, from evidence to action, um, achieving universal health coverage and the SDGs. Um, so uh, I hope you'll enjoy our uh, panel session in this conference as well. So over to you, Nancy. So for the upcoming year, we're really planning on uh, building on uh, each of these initiatives. So we are planning on piloting the capacity building project for global nursing workforce, likely in, in Nepal. We plan to draft and publish a joint paper on the state of the global work health force. We want to draft a, a full a concept sheet and a full proposal on um, nursing leadership uh, development. And finally, we will be uh, completing a rural physicians workforce survey in Nepal and plan to publish that paper. And lastly, uh, we've just started to work on a policy brief, uh, making recommendations for ethical migration of healthcare worker for workforce. So thank you very much. Please let us know if you have any questions after this session. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Nancy and Suraj. Uh, so next up will be our capacity building subcommittee. Hi, my name is Andrew. I'm one of the co-chairs of the capacity building subcommittee alongside Honoré. In 2021, we focused primarily on the promotion of the capacity building database on the CUGH website. This can be found at www.cughcapacitybuilding.org. This database is designed to catalog the capacity building needs and capacity building expertise or resources that exist at training institutions globally in order to identify possible global health partnerships with a focus on capacity building. We encourage everyone to engage with this database and spread it among your partners and networks globally. With a robust utilization of this database, there is considerable opportunity for identifying uh, partnerships that could be potentially very impactful. In addition to promotion of our database, we identified a focus initiative on cervical cancer over the summer of 2020. This has resulted in a conference poster presentation. 
We as well recruited new members and new co-chairs. We are currently at 18 total members. So we, are, we will be welcoming new members in the near future. We have also advanced beyond cervical cancer to additional priority areas, including mental health, nursing, and implementation science. We will be conducting these focused initiatives very soon. If you have an interest in any of these, please go to our database website, www.cughcapacitybuilding.org and register, and we will be in touch. We also encourage anyone with general interest in capacity building also to engage with our database. We also have worked on developing a collaborative partner part project with the Workforce Subcommittee. Our upcoming goals include the advancement of our priority areas as discussed and the addition of, uh, of, uh, of additional focus and initiatives, including, for, for example, global surgery, diabetes, or nutrition. We also would like to advance the collaborative capacity building subcommittee workforce subcommittee pilot project, which is currently taking shape in Nepal. We also would like to identify technical expertise and funding to advance our platform and database by developing an improver, improved user interface, filtering capabilities, and reporting operability. If you know of someone with programming technical expertise, we would be greatly indebted for that connection. We would love to add this type of expertise to our group. We'll also be expanding our partnerships by reaching out to regional professional organizations globally, and we will be expanding our membership through more recruitment. We'd like to remind you that our database is at www.cughcapacitybuilding.org. Please engage with this database and, and catalog your existing training capacity needs or resources, expertise, and please spread this among your connections, your networks, and your partners globally. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much uh, to Andrew and Anarud. Um, and then last but not least, we have our graduate medical education uh, working group. Hi, my name is Jenny Benziger. I'm the Associate Director of Education for the Indiana University Center for Global Health. And I'm going to be giving our GME subcommittee report. The GME um, subcommittee traditionally focuses on graduate level education um, learning issues, both for international and local partnerships and figuring out what learners and those, the audience might need. So in 2020 to 2021, we prioritized our goals, <clears throat> figured out what different subcommittee members would like to work on, and we decided to focus our efforts on a curriculum that we're calling GHEART. Global Health Education and Resident Training. This is a foundational global health curriculum applicable to US and Canadian residents of at least moderate interest in global health from all specialties. These are residents that traditionally would be in a global health track or something like that. And the goal is to develop an outline for about 12 to 20 educational hours on which different specialties could add their own specialty specific information and educational learning objectives. So we researched existing curricula that are present in some of each specialty. And then we brainstormed, discussed, and narrowed topics that we thought every resident um, in a global health track would need to know. We're at the phase where we're seeking feedback and review of our curricular outline. And if you go to this link here, we'd love to have your feedback on what we have decided. And we give huge um, credit and props to the CGH toolkit because um, that really helped us think about things as well um, for this more narrow audience. In the next year, <clears throat> we have a lot of different goals and a lot of things that we're excited to work on, um, depending on how this all plays out. But there has been a lot of interest in developing a resource sharing platform for GME level global health educators where we could just share curricula or things um, that have worked well or have, didn't work as well. We'd love to investigate ways to support GME in low and middle income countries, especially through partnerships. For example, um, this may take the form of an educational needs assessment toolkit. How do you do that in a global health setting and how do you help each partner decide um, and learn about their partners by figuring what, out what they need educational wise. Um, and we'd also love to look into um, all the many successful teleeducation models that have flourished in the pandemic. 
things like the ECHO conferences or partnerships that have really had a good opportunity to build relationships even virtually. There's a lot of interest in figuring out what works and what doesn't work. A long-standing interest is to develop a consolidated list of global health fellowships that could be um, curated by CUGH. Of course, we can't have resident education unless we have junior faculty. So anything we can do to strengthen the development of global health-minded junior faculty. And then um, supporting bilateral exchange through developing orientation guidelines or materials for GME level trainees that are coming um, to rotate with us to help facilitate and um, make that exchange a little bit easier for both sides. None of this would have been possible without our team. I give them huge props here. Thanks to everybody that has participated and made the switch to a, a pandemic world quite easily. Um, it's been really fun to work with everyone. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jenny. Excellent. All right, everybody. Well, while we get set up for the hot topics, I just want to thank one more time our, our subcommittee um, chairs and just acknowledge briefly that they do a huge amount of work over the course of the year. So both the chairs as well as the members of the subcommittees are really who drive forward the educational products of uh, CGH. They're the people who make programs and projects happen. Um, we are working to kind of better capture all the output from that. I think both the academic papers as well as the other um, things that have gone forward to help change education and help change how we teach trainees in a range of settings. Um, so I'm hopeful that our website in the next few months will kind of better reflect all the work. It already has a lot of it, but we want to make sure we're capturing every last drop that we've done over the last several years. But, you know, tremendous amount of work done. Uh, and really, I think um, the, the engine in a lot of ways for the education committee uh, is definitely the, the subcommittees you've just heard from. Um, and again, I'll, I'll echo or remind people that if you um, want to get involved, there's a lot of ways to get involved. I'll put some more things into the chat uh, in terms of some of the email lists. And then we have uh, calls for membership regularly um, to get people, new people onto the subcommittees um, each year. Uh, so next we're gonna have the hot topic presentations. These will be about 10 minutes each. And we're going to skip the Q&A for the chairs just because of time, um, but I think we will be caught up after this point. And during the hot topics, uh, again, I'm going to encourage participants, if you guys have questions or comments about what's being discussed, please feel free to put it in the chat. Since the speakers are not talking live, uh, they will be able to engage with you in the chat as well. And then at the end of this session, uh, we'll pick out a few of the sort of most in interesting or engaging questions and have some um, live video responses from those speakers. With that, I'll pass over Tracy. Wonderful. Thanks so much, James. Um, so, um, you know, very excited. We have five um, hot topics presentations for you today. Just to um, to let the group know, this was a, um, a competitive process. Quite a number of people had submitted um, uh, proposals to present at hot topics, and so our selection committee had a really difficult time choosing. But I think we've come up with a program that's going to be um, so fantastic and really touches on a lot of the the key issues that folks in the global health education world are struggling with. Uh, right now. Um, our first presentation on decolonizing global health is actually going to be made up of four separate smaller presentations. So I'm going to ask everyone to just be generous and bear with me as we run the sort of individual tech pieces for those. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with, um, with our first hot topic presentation. Welcome everyone to our hot topic discussion on decolonizing global health education. My name is Carlos Alberto Faye Rongusman. I am an assistant professor of global health at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. I also direct the Centro Interamericano para la Salud Global here in Costa Rica, where I'm giving you four from. I am joined in this panel by Dr. Stephanie Chow Garbern, who is an assistant professor of emergency medicine at the Albert Medical School of Brown University. I am also joined by her close colleague and collaborator, Dr. Catalina Gonzalez Marquez, who is an emergency medicine physician. And finally, I am joined by Dr. E.G. Omanodim Opara, who is an assistant professor of internal medicine and pediatrics at Wayne State University. She is also the founding director of health equity and justice in medicine at that same institution and a co-founding director, co director of Global Health Alliance and Global Urban Health Equity in Detroit, Michigan. We'll try to go over the term decolonization, how it's used currently in, in global health practice, what are some examples of, of, of decolonizing global health 
or neocolonial mindsets that are still impacting global health. And then we'll try to map forward uh, uh, some key uh, issues on how we can move forward in, 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 in regards to how do we decolonize global health education. Part of the conversation we would like, like to have is try to understand that beyond a hot topic, this is a framework that we want to use that will stick in time and that we'll be able to rely on as we look at our global health education endeavors. So beyond something that is just in fashion or vogue, I think the term decolonization should stay in, in, our, in our vocabulary for, for, for a long time. Part of why we consider it a hot topic or why it's considered a hot topic is that if we do a quick Google Scholar search, and again, this isn't a robust research analysis or bibliometrical analysis, this is just a quick Google search that I did uh, before recording this, we can see that the term decolonization in global health has been used quite frequently if we compare this custom range of, of these four years, and I, I got around 1,800 hits, but if you compare that to the decade preceding, as I'm going to show you in this slide, which is a custom range from 2006 to 2016, that is the decade preceding these last four years, we actually get almost the same amount of hits. That is, in 10 years, there has been almost the same research production as the last four years. And when you look at these last four years, actually the last two years is where most of the literature using the terms decolonization and global health is, is, is coming from. So in, in fact, it is a hot topic, but as I said earlier, we would wish that the framework and the terminology and some of the things that we're trying to emerge from this conversation actually stay in time. One of the things I get asked a lot around the term decolonization is, is this a term that we are pushing down on the people from global, south, from global north to global south? So are the people in the global south using the term decolonization? There's a straight answer, it is yes. It's important to remember that the term decolonization actually emerges after uh, on the independent movement after the Second World War. And since then, it has stayed in, in, the, in the jargon to uh, denote uh, how to stop oppression, how to decolonize mindsets, how to make equi how to make a, a more equitable and fair world. So the term decolonization itself, as you can see from again you, uh, supporting myself in, in Google, this is a Google trend search in which the term decolonization from 2004 that I did worldwide from 2004 to the present actually is being used more widely in countries that we used to be previous colonies. So this tells us that the framework of decolonization is actually widely used in the global south. And just to kind of give you examples on how it's being used, this is a series of books that were published by global south authors in which they're using the decolonization framework, maybe not applied to global health, but applied to kind of the general understanding of how we understand and see the world. And they're using it uh, as, as a way to denote that we need to start moving forward, be it in research methodologies, be it on how we understand the political landscape of the world, how we understand economics, how we understand institutions, the decolonizing framework needs to be applied. So part of what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the history of the term. We're going to talk about examples on how it's impacting global health education, and we're going to try to map a way forward. I'm now going to move it down to my colleague, Dr. Stephanie Chow, who's going to explain to us how the term has been used historically and how we're using it now. Thanks for your attention. So in order for us to talk about the decolonization of global health, we need to first explore and understand the history of what we call global health today and its roots in colonialism, imperialism, and racism to understand where we're coming from. So although I just have a few minutes, I'm going to present just a brief background on colonialism and global health. And I definitely, definitely encourage you to join our roundtable discussions um, to discuss this further. So global health began at the time um, of colonialism, when European colonial powers began setting up colonies and establishing control over lands in Africa, Asia, the Americas, and the Caribbean. 
And later, other countries, such as the United States, would also take part in these practices as well. Um, but from its very inception, colonial medicine was concerned primarily with preventing disease and illness that threatened white Europeans and their colonial holdings. Um, whereas the colonies and the colonized people were often viewed as the sources of infections, which would then infect and harm Europeans. And so tropical medicine was established as, um, as a way of controlling those diseases and protecting Europeans. And most early interventions were developed in colonial settings under colonial rule. Um, and in this context, there were there developed the ideas about the inability of colonized people to improve their own health. Um, and also this led to the development of tropical medicine um, and ideas that exist in global health today. So there are many examples um, that I can give, but as one example, we can take the foundation of American tropical medicine. So at the turn of the 19th century, the United States um, was determined and under intense commercial pressure to construct the Panama Canal, which would create a passage between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, which is extremely important for trade and economic purposes. Um, the French had attempted to do this in the late 1800s, but failed after the deaths of more than 20,000 workers from yellow fever and malaria. So around this time, a U U.S. Army physician named William Gorgas, using the research findings of another U.S. Army doctor, Major Walter Reed, um, had shown that yellow fever was spread, in fact, by mosquitoes, and that by controlling mosquitoes, um, one could control or even eliminate yellow fever, which um, Dr. Gorgas was able to do in Havana, where there was a large American population living. Um, so Dr. Gorgas ended up being brought to Panama um, to control yellow fever um, during the construction of the canal, uh, mainly uh, to protect uh, the U.S. interests um, and prevent the infection among the mainly um, uh, uh, contract workers who had been brought over from the West Indies to work on the canal. And while the campaign was successful and the can canal was eventually built, um, this led to a lot of these deeply ingrained notions of the dependence of the native populations on foreign tropical medicine experts as saviors. And these concepts were written about and um, described by Gorgas himself, for instance, in this article um, called The Conquest of um, the Tropics for the White Race, which was published in what is now the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and in this and his other writings, he compares um, the prevalence of disease in the jungles to the barbarism of the natives and also links scientific progress with white racial superiority. Um, and today we can see um, his influence, um, which lasts today um, in, um, uh, for instance, the, uh, the building of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, as well as the Gorgas Clinical Course in Tropical Medicine. And this just goes to show how global health and tropical medicine were not in fact focused on an altruistic desire to improve the health of local populations, but were rather there to serve US um, or other colonial national interests. And um, over, health, over time, uh, global health has had several revisions or makeovers. Um, I like this terminology um, by former ed editor of the BMJ, Richard Smith, describing the progression of global health um, 1.0 as tropical medicine to 2.0 or international health, and really 3.0, which I think is what we are in today, um, where researchers and academics from rich countries lead programs in poor countries, and how we may eventually um, hopefully um, get to global health 4.0, where um, academics and research and education are led by those from low and middle income countries. And now I'll hand it over to my colleague, Carolina, to discuss um, some examples of this today. And so I'm going to be diving in to how global health is still colonial in many ways. And I'm going to be highlighting a few examples of how we see these themes continue to play out. Um, I do want to say before I start is that this is in no way an exhaustive list. Um, every time I sit and I reflect on this topic, I feel like I see how pervasive it is and how there's more and more examples every day 
Um, but this is just meant to highlight a few and some of maybe the more dramatic examples that we see. And so let's look specifically at global health leadership and maybe funding and seeing how it's still very much colonial. And to highlight a few examples, global health institutions are typically still based in the global north, and they very often lack representation of the key communities at the decision making table and therefore aren't equipped to adequately consider the needs of the local community in which they intend to serve. And we also see that global health organizations are mostly headquartered in high income countries and run very often primarily by men from high income countries. When recent studies have shown, and I think all of us who work in this field know that the labor of global health is largely done and performed by women in low and middle income countries. And let's also talk about funding opportunities. Funding opportunities are often unidirectional. Again, that north to south flow and are highly concentrated in high income countries with little opportunity for our colleagues and our partners in low and middle income countries to access those funds. And global health authorship, again, this could be a whole topic in itself, has had some problematic areas in that sometimes instead of seeing authorship parity, we're seeing more parasitism or a lack of low and middle income country authors being represented in high positions on academic papers. And now kind of thinking more broadly, because this is an educational conference about global health education and the ways in which that is still colonial, we're gonna highlight a few examples here. You know, there was a recent paper that came out that highlighted this kind of emergence of uh, global health degree programs, but it remains unclear who the target audience of these degree programs are and what it might cost to earn one of those degrees. And in this paper, it very eloquently highlighted how most of these countries are housed in high income countries, but also would be cost prohibitive um, to other people from low and middle income countries. So are we perpetuating this again, north south divide? And there's differential standards that often exist for educational opportunities or supervision of foreign students during global health electives or rotations. And we see this in numerous volunteerism trips or parachuting trips. And a little bit of a more uncomfortable um, elucidation of that is students being allowed to perform invasive procedures that they would never be allowed to perform at their home institutions, um, you know, practicing medical procedures on patients in a way that is extremely ethically concerning. And I think another one which um, most of us would be familiar with is the use of foreign experts in light of or instead of using the extremely valuable local expertise that exists. Um, and another uncomfortable example of that is seeing high income country graduate students or residents teaching much more senior or experienced medical faculty or otherwise um, academic faculty in low and middle income countries. And again, we could we could continue with numerous examples, um, but to give a visual example and maybe a more topical one is this is from a recent BBC report just looking at who has access to the current coronavirus vaccine. And again, we just see this incredible north south divide and the vaccine being concentrated in high income countries with almost a desert or no data on vaccination in low and middle income countries. Thank you, Stephanie, Carlos, and Catalina. And so on the subject of decolonizing global health and global health education, where do we go from here? Well, we will argue that it will require a threefold shift. 
a shift in paradigm, a shift in leadership, and a shift in knowledge. So let's talk about the paradigm, paradigm shift that is required. Uh, we would say that number one, decolonizing would need to happen through curricula. And so decolonize it by developing global health curricula, learning objectives and competencies. Um, decolonization would need to happen in the form of adopting fair trade principles to educational programs. And decolonizing would need to happen by emphasizing patient safety and framing the conversation within the context of patient safety and population and community safety. And finally, decolonizing will need to happen by addressing power dynamics in uh, development narratives. And so when we discuss this and we talk about paradigm shift, what we again mean is in those four areas that a health justice framework be adapted. And so conversations about colonialism, racism, sexism, and capitalism, we need to be centered in global health curricula, in the adoption of fair trade principles, um, and, and of course, that, that it, you cannot have these discussions without talking about power. And it's important to frame this also as intersectional um, uh, uh, dynamics that are occurring as it relates to global health. We need to give credence to history and ground what we're doing in global health and global health education in a historical context, because ignoring or avoiding these conversations really renders us complicit in participating and perpetuating the injustices that we claim to be uh, uh, against, so to speak. And so it, it is also necessary that then we provide context, right, to these global health uh, realities and ground health and disease in the broader system of coloniality. And finally, institutions, missions, programs, and structures will need to adapt to this. We need to be able to learn from and collaborate and build coalition with organizing uh, uh, communities. And so folks who are activists and organizers in this space and how they intentionally disrupt power structures in their work. And so that will require changing who is at the table as it relates to global health education um, from what might look like something on the or to your to your left to more so to what looks like something on your right. In fact, it might require changing the table itself as we contend with power structures and systems um, uh, that, that, are rooted, that are rooted in white supremacy vis-a-vis -vis colonialism, racism, um, sexism, etc. Secondly, let's talk about the shift required in leadership. We will need to uh, interrogate and really confront who we consider a leader in global health, as well as what exactly is leadership. And so currently, those who sit at tables and in rooms of uh, decision making and, and rooms of and halls of power do not look like those to, uh, who, for whom they uh, claim that they're representing. And so this uh, mismatch of representation and, and, and those in, on the leadership, in the leadership spaces uh, that claim to, uh, to speak on behalf of uh, the, 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 those that they, that they state that they represent, that mismatch, with, mismatch needs to be reconciled, all right? And so that will require for the global north, so-called global north, to lean out. In other words, to actively and intentionally stop reproducing racist and colonialist ideologies. It will require there to be a commitment to recognizing the innovation that is uh, occurring in the so-called global south and the leadership therein. And it is very important that intentional attention is paid to gender inequity in global health. Uh, understanding and acknowledging that women, particularly women of color, are underrepresented and excluded from global health policy and programming. And so that we're talking about equitable representation in academic uh, journals. We're talking about equitable first authorship positions for collaborators from the global south and women. We're talking about appropriate equitable representation on leadership uh, in leadership positions and faculty makeup. And finally, a shift needs to occur in knowledge. And that means the, the prioritization of bi-directionality. Uh, really, uh, again, a call to interrogate and deconstruct what we consider knowledge, what we consider evidence, um, questioning who gets to set best practices in global health and who is considered an expert. 
And so bi-directionality needs to be centered in order to build geopolitical, uh, build bridges that, that uh, bring together geopolitical imbalances in global health education, um, whereby we can be uh, uh, we can be organized to create new learning platforms that promotes anti-colonial thought, that opens uh, the, that that cr makes the space accessible to those who don't speak English, um, that is accessible, financially accessible, as in their low cost, that they uh, provide a space for um, those in low and middle income countries to really lead the conversation and lead and drive the agenda and the priorities. Of the of, of global health and global health education, such that training and knowledge is shared by both parties versus being uh, dominated and directed and driven by one, which is, which is again folks in the Western Hemisphere. So that will require again a twofold double shift, and that means to teach um, with and and. and it, 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 global health uh, and address inequitable global disease burdens within an enabling environment um, that centers critical inquiry into racist and colonialist history, which is the cause and the driver of these inequitable global disease burdens. I want to leave uh, with a thought, uh, with really an opportunity to challenge us, um, uh, you know, as, as I conclude, is decolonization of global health even possible? And so the work of Leoba, Dr. Leoba Hirsch um, causes us to, to, to look within and reflect that if we want to transform uh, the institutions of global health, it is equally important to recognize that internal institutional systems were historically designed to maintain overall structures of power that institutional processes of decolonization themselves will always be constrained by the imagination and willingness of global health leadership in high income countries to bring about and finance sustainable and fundamental change. And so we have to then ask ourselves if institutional processes of decolonization today are an attempt to complete the reversal of Western dominance in politics, economy, and health governance, then one, is it realistic to finish in committees and councils and work groups and task forces what began through insurgent action? And two, Given the inherent violence of colonialism, can we truly achieve decolonization by working through channels that were set up within the same structures that uphold white supremacy? In other words, are global health institutions even ready to give up power? With that, I thank you for this time. My email is here, and so is my handle on social media, um, Instagram and Twitter. And I appreciate your time and look forward to uh, meeting face to face virtually um, in through the whatever conference platform CUGH has. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much to this powerhouse group um, for such for such a fantastic presentation. It's been wonderful to just see the what's been going on in the chat. And I hope that we'll be able to have a little bit of an opportunity for you guys to speak during our question and answer start piece. And then I know um, your group is also going to be running one of the round tables. So there will be plenty of opportunity for um, folks who are on this meeting to, to be able to engage with our presenters uh, today. Um, so I am going to shift us, keep us moving along in the agenda um, and shift us to our next um, hot topic, um, which is from our trainee advisory committee um, and is going to be um, sharing the preliminary results um, from their student and trainee global health interests and barriers study. Three. Hi, my name is Priscilla August and I'm a fourth, fourth year medical student at Ross University and the chair of the trainee advisory committee. Uh, my name is Ryan Hodgman. I'm a fourth year medical student at Michigan State University and also a member of the trainee advisory committee. So we wanted to start this discussion off by quickly giving you a background into why we're doing this study as far as you know, the goals of what the study are is. And so in general, global health is, is just a very attractive, rapidly growing multidisciplinary field that brings in students from very diverse backgrounds. While there are institutions around the world that are offering programs to address this, there's still limited research on the global health insights, the experiences, the interests, and the barriers that students face when trying to pursue this field. Uh, in order to investigate this further, we created a survey for students and trainees in global health 
Uh, our primary objectives to understand and quantify the interests of students and trainees and their perceived barriers to entry and sustained activity in the field of global health. We also had some secondary objectives to understand the avenues of global health that students and trainees perceived as successful, their current involvement in global health, and their satisfaction with their current status in global health. Demographics of the survey to date, uh, participants uh, are described uh, on this slide. A few things to point out, unsurprisingly, academic area of concentration heavily favors medical practice, which is more than twice any other single discipline. Additionally, current location of participants is mostly from the Americas with 56% reported living in North America at the time of the survey. It is worth noting that the survey was only available in, in the English language. Two perhaps more surprising findings from our survey takers were the high proportion of self-identified female to male ratio, which comes in at nearly two to one. And although most report living in North America at the time of participation in the survey, there's a relatively equal distribution in self-identified country of origin income between high income at about 49.7% and lower middle income countries at 47.1%. Uh, several areas of interest were explored, including how a subject would like to practice, what they want to practice, and how much of his or her career would be dedicated to global health related activities. Charts on this slide show that medical practice, community health and development, and research were the most common areas of interest, with newer to the scene One Health concentrations, such as engineering and veterinary medicine, ranking lower on the list. Working domestically on global health related projects was the most common career goal at over 60% of participants compared to the longer or shorter term trips abroad options, which are all ranked similar. We use the Likert scale to gauge attractiveness of professional development opportunities for students and trainees. Participants reported that working with underserved populations and research projects were the most sought after whereas teaching opportunities and ethics training were ranked somewhat lower. And finally, the amount of professional time, uh, FTE was split fairly evenly over, with over half wishing to dedicate 11 to 50% of their time to global health related activities. So over the next couple of slides, I'm gonna to briefly touch on what students have told us so far concerning how they pursue global health, their satisfaction, their successes, and their barriers that they had to pursuing it as a long-term career. So starting from this figure, you can kind of see that there, for the most part, a majority of students and trainees start their global health career path through either NGOs, academic programs, or extracurricular activities. With the setup of how they get involved in the first place, it's interesting to see here that most students are either somewhat satisfied or somewhat dissatisfied on how things with go are going. Only 13.8% reported being extremely satisfied with their current level of involvement. So the question then becomes, what is their perspective in regards to their successes? Were there avenues to a global health career that they felt were successful or unsuccessful? And have you here you see that a majority of students agree that extracurricular organizations, clubs, or groups were a successful way to pursue global health opportunities, second by academic programs. But on the contrary, most students have never tried research posting boards, and a surprising 44% have never tried mentorship, while just under 20% felt that contacting mentors was actually not, they perceived not to be a successful uh, avenue. Here we have the barriers that students perceive to global health. And after discussing the successing, successes, the question becomes, you know, what is holding students back? So first I'll talk about what's not so surprising. More than 70% of students agree that lack of funding, issues with time constraints and problems with work-life balance were barriers in their global health pursuits. These are elements that I believe many of us are familiar with. What is striking, however, is that more than 50% also agree that some of the barriers to global health pursuits include being unsure where to find those opportunities, having no targeted global health curricular at their institution, and difficulty with finding an advisor or a mentor. These issues help to highlight the potential gaps in student and training global health pursuits. 
with approximately 200 uh, consented responses so far, uh, we are still collecting data, but we have some preliminary conclusions, uh, which are as follows. Medical practice, community health and development and research were the most often reported future long-term areas of concentration for global health activities. Working with underserved populations in research were the most attractive opportunities for professional development within this group. And finally, uh, working domestically on projects was the most common career trajectory goal reported. So there is an interest in global health pursuits. There's still gaps in the pathway that leads students and trainees to actually even entering the workforce in the first place. So, and especially in the, in the area of mentorship. So essentially we need to look into these gaps in order to understand how we can stop, how we can step in and come alongside students and trainees in their pursuits to a successful global health career. Uh, we'd like to thank our principal investigator, Dr. Rebecca Malwin, uh, who's taking great care to guide us in the right direction. Uh, we'd also like to acknowledge our excellent research team whose names are listed above, who have worked so hard and bring this project together. We're really thankful for the opportunity to present our work to this group, and we're looking for, forward to discussing it further with you all. If you're attending the conference, we'll be having another session around during the conference that you can also attend where you can um, learn more about this, about our study. Note that this, is, this particular meeting is not actually just for people who are attending the conference, so anyone can actually come to this session. And please do follow us on our various uh, social media platforms and stop by the CUGH TAC booth. Thank you for listening. Great. Thank you so much, Priscilla and Ryan. Um, just to, to let everybody know, uh, they will be um, having a roundtable later on in our program to talk about the, um, the results so far of the study. Um, and then there will also be a separate roundtable um, for the Trainee Advisory Committee. So if there are folks who are interested in learning just more about the committee, there will be a separate roundtable to, um, uh, to engage with the, um, with the chairs about that as well. Okay, so moving us along to our next hot topic. I would like to introduce uh, Stephanie Lucas and Susie Crow, who are going to be um, giving a talk entitled CPR for your global health educational partnerships during pandemics, challenges, practical solutions, and reinforced relationships. Hello, thank you for joining us today for our presentation, CPR for your global health educational partnerships during pandemics, challenges, practical solutions, and reinforced partnerships. I'm Dr. Stephanie Lucas at University of Health Sciences and Pharmacy in St. Louis. I'll be speaking with you first, followed by Dr. Susie Crow at East Tennessee State University, Billing, Bill Guyton College of Pharmacy in the United States as well. Um, and Dr. Sarah Padadar at the University of Eswatini in the country of Eswatini. Our objectives today are to talk to you about the foundational concepts of ethical collaboration for global health partnerships and to discuss how you might pivot your global health partnerships ethically during COVID-19, um, including touching on both some of the barriers and some of the opportunities. We'll start off talking about our ethical foundations of global health partnerships, realizing that this is a complex conversation and that we can't cover fully in just a couple of minutes. We have included a couple of references at the end where you can read more about this. As we talk about global health partnerships, we want to make sure that these are mutually beneficial, that they're mutually respectable, and you treat all members with respect, um, that we remember that each both institution and faculty members within those institutions are going to bring something unique to the table, be it technical knowledge, cultural context, facilities. Um, and so making sure that our partnerships have shared leadership, shared goal setting, and ultimately shared problem solving. Working within each of our scopes is important, not only in the clinical or practice settings, but making sure that we are covering lectures um, up with our appropriate backgrounds, uh, as well as thinking about that with research, um, research opportunities and um, looking at that from an academic model as well. As we think about these partnerships, we need to realize that they will take both human and financial resources from both institutions. Not only what are both institutions willing to contribute, but what are they able to put forth? And then thinking together about how you can come together to find additional resources or develop those resources. 
Ultimately, a partnership should be filling in each other's gaps um, to help address problems that a single institution can't resolve. And when you have a good partnership, it will be sustainable, ultimately promoting capacity building within both sides of the partnership um, to educate, uh, educate our students and our stakeholders with the ultimate goal of stronger health systems, reducing global disparities, and ultimately improving patient care and public health. Now to Dr. Crow. So as Dr. Lucas just mentioned, the pillars of sustainability, shared leadership, and assuring mutual benefit for all partners are all essential to um, global health engagement. However, along comes COVID in 2020, early on in the year, and this has really impacted our partnerships in a number of ways. And so some of the challenges that have been faced include um, shifting from that traditional classroom challenge uh, um, environment to an online or uh, partially online, partially um, in-person environment, and that's happened both in the U.S. and globally. Other challenges of moving to online learning, including expensive internet and learning devices for students and faculty, internet connections, which can be a problem uh, for, for, again, for both students and faculty, licenses for online platforms for things even such as SurveyMonkey, uh, faculty needing to learn how to use those learning platforms, um, and then keeping students engaged in an online learning format can also be a challenge. Also, uh, the financial impact of COVID on all partners, um, including um, overall for the overall university that has impacted some global health funding within some universities, and then travel bans uh, that include both international um, travel bans, both in the United States and for some of our partners, and national quarantine requirements as well. And then border closings in some locations and time zone issues as we're trying to shift our partnerships from uh, possibly an in-person format to being more online. Uh, so ETSU formed a partnership with Inverar University of Science Tech and Technology and Inverar Regional Referral Hospital in 2017. And ETSU's side of the collaboration involves teaching lectures and rounding in internal medicine wards at Inverar Regional Referral Hospital. This has all occurred in person um, up until this point in time. And again, the partnership was explored in 2017. And really since then, uh, we have two different faculty members involved, but we spent a total of two and a half months in country um, since the partnership started in 2000. Uh, and those timeframes were in 2018 and 19. In 2019, uh, the faculty visit was cut short due to um, a few Ebola cases uh, along the western border of Uganda. And so instead of getting to spend an entire month, I only spent two weeks. And so all of that time is very limited when you're talking about a new partnership. And so our partners partnership hasn't really had the opportunity to really build that strong foundation in global health engagement um, using those pillars just yet. We're working toward that and progressing toward that, but we haven't reached that yet. Additional challenges have been um, a must has started a new clinical pharmacy master's program, so their workload was impacted even before uh, COVID, and now COVID has added additional challenges, uh, workload for our ETSU faculty as well, uh, communication has been a challenge, and so really we paused this partnership um, for now based on um, all of the challenges that we've had. So here in Eswatini, we've had a long-standing relationship with the University of Health Sciences and Pharmacy in St. Louis. Since 2014, we've received PharmD students from the United States who have come to Eswatini as part of a non-clinical rotation to experience pharmacy practice in our health system here in Southern Africa. But as Dr. Crow explained from the experience in Uganda, the travel ban meant that we in Eswatini also had to pause the student field experience because providing a virtual rotation to US-based students was not a viable option due to the prohibitive costs and infrastructure challenges that we have here. However, COVID has provided a number of opportunities. A week into our lockdown, we as a country were trying to think through how we can best assess the experiences of our residents to the new public health and social measures implemented to prevent the spread of COVID here in Eswatini. 
What we didn't have was a platform to implement this research. And this was something that UHSB did have access to. So together with students from both the United States and Eswatini, Dr. Lucas and I collaborated on, with an online research project based here in Southern Africa using the SurveyMonkey platform. From this very simple survey, we have since applied for funding together, each of us taking the lead on different proposals, designing and developing a research program and offering scholarships for both countries students for the years to come. Additionally, we're also now one of the international partners taking the lead in one of the courses in the Global Health and Equity Master's Program that will be offered from this August at UHSP. So what COVID did was to catalyze and accelerate the natural evolution of our existing relationship. We had been discussing for a number of years how we can work on different projects together. But what COVID did was to force these timelines to move upwards, resulting in our relationship to be both strengthened, we're working more closely, more equitably, and more diversely. When we come to look at global partnerships, what we need to do is to first pause. We paused, for example, in Uganda, we paused here in Eswatini, and we said, is what we're doing still the priority? What are the challenges that we're having? Are there things that we can do together to help overcome some of these challenges? Are there things that we need to stop doing? For example, we stop the student rotations. Are there things that we can start doing? So we can start taking the opportunities that have been presented to us. These are some of the questions that we can think about as we go into the round tables. I'd like to end by thanking all the staff and students at the University of Health Sciences and Pharmacy in St. Louis, the East Tennessee State Bill Gatton College of Pharmacy, the University of Eswatini and Mbarara University of Science and Technology. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful, thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. Um, and as you just heard, so um, Stephanie, Susie and Sarah will be leading a round table later on in our program. So please uh, join them to, uh, to talk more and hear more about their experiences. Okay, so moving on to our next presentation, we are going to have uh, Ashti Dubé Persaud and Colleen Fant from Northwestern University presenting their talk uh, entitled A New MEPI, Northwestern University Medical Education Partnership Initiative. My name is Ashti Dubé Persaud. I'm an assistant professor of medicine and medical education. I co-direct our Center for Global Health Education at our Institute for Global Health and I'm a hospitalist who directs our section of global health and hospital medicine at Northwestern University. Uh, today, I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Fant, and we'll be describing two medical educational medical education partnerships through Northwestern and um, how we pivoted during the time of COVID. So we hope that by the end of this lecture, you'll be able to understand how successful training programs and more, important, more importantly, partnerships can be developed and implemented at a distance. We hope that you'll be able to reevaluate your own global health educational partnerships at your academic medical centers to identify opportunities that strengthen collaboration and achieve the best practices in partnership using new online and distance learning platforms. So our story begins around January slash February of 2020. We had just uh, started two new projects. One was our first project, which is the palliative care program that we were collaborating with our colleagues at Lagos University Teaching Hospital um, to make happen. And so that uh, project was really around designing, developing and implementing an interdisciplinary palliative care program with our colleagues at Lagos University Teaching Hospital. The second project, with Dr. which Dr. Fant will tell you more about, is a pediatric emergency care simulation program with colleagues from Masano University in Kisumu, Kenya. 
the aims being providing pediatric emergency medicine simulations, teaching and training faculty in the pedagogy. And then the, finally with our with the Maseno faculty implementing training for students after um, after going through their own uh, their own training. So we were in very early stages of planning. We had an overall kind of similar plan with uh, co-creation of the curriculum, highly contextualized by our partners. We were really gonna you know, make sure that our faculty and educators on the ground were supported to make this happen. NU was gonna bring funding and technical expertise in both simulation and, and palliative care teaching and training. And the whole plan was to pair faculty development with um, learner implementation in a phased manner with sequencing, deliberate practice, and feedback. We sort of planned two to three in-person trainings with our partner faculty and then with the learners over maybe one to two years, and we hadn't really decided what the overall structure was going to be like, but loosely. And then along came the COVID pandemic, which, you know, has disrupted and caused a lot of uh, tragedy, of course, worldwide, but we had to really look at our work and say, what are we gonna do with our partnership? And it was time to reevaluate and pause. Were we gonna be able to do these projects at all? Were they important? Um, and actually our relationships accelerated around this time between January, February, 2020, and uh, fall where we were having a lot of meetings and learning what was going on and deciding are we going to do something with this? And so through collaborative decision-making, we made a lot of, uh, we determined a lot of pivots and everything shifted. The place where everything was happening, you know, the sort of brain and heart of the work really was exactly where it should be, right? With our partners, the power to make the decisions, the power to make planning, all of that shifted to our partners and they were sort of calling the shots. Um, and decided they really wanted to move forward and not just move forward, but move forward faster than anticipated. So we used online collaborative platforms, distance learning, management systems and techniques, and a lot of open dialogue, feedback, and a lot of time. And it turned out we were able to develop contextualized teaching materials and the context and the strategy moved to where it should be, where our hosts were. And so this is a visual diagram that Dr. Fant made to sort of describe the change in paradigm. No longer a vertical structure where everything is determined by your host in terms of leadership, development, design, and then you fly in or parachute in with an educational project. Actually, yes, the funding is still there, but all of a sudden the second, third, and fourth parts of planning moved into a horizontal space sort of an enormous virtual office and leadership, program design, program development all moved into a different plane. Um, and our hope of course is it's already being implemented but that there will be some in-person work at some point with these deeply developed relationships. Uh, very quickly, I just wanted to tell you what the program looked like at Luth, um, uh, Lagos University Teaching Hospital. We adapted and implemented two existing online um, educational materials, and they were all reviewed, selected, adapted by teams of interdisciplinary healthcare professionals at Lagos University Teaching Hospital. We had weekly meetings, extensive stakeholder engagement with faculty being recruited from across Nigeria, weekly curriculum review, and we were presented with a lot of fascinating technical design opportunities and challenges. And we learned a lot um, technically from our colleagues as well. And um, training one of three happened in November and there were 35 learners who attended. Of note, they all felt more confident after their training. They were all recommended to a colleague. Prior to this, 75% um, of the learners that had attended had no uh, previous training in palliative care. But the two more impactful outcomes were the systems outcomes. So if you look to the right here, our speakers, there's the dark, dark sort of teal is Northwestern and everyone else is from an institute in Nigeria, an academic medical center in Nigeria. So this training catalyzed 
the development of a collaboration between palliative care experts, leading institutions in Nigeria, of which we are not involved anymore at all. And the second really enormous impact was that this work led to a decision by the leaders at Lagos University Teaching Hospital to establish some sort of formal palliative care delivery program for the first time. So now I'll turn it over to Dr. Fant, who will tell you a bit more about our work in Kazumi. Hi, so I'm Colleen Fant. I'm a pediatric emergency medicine attending at Lurie Children's, and I uh, work with um, Ashley in the Center for Global Health Education. So this partnership, well, like Ashley said, sort of started to come into its own in the beginning of 2020 and sort of shifted over time. Our initial goals were to take a pediatric medicine um, or pediatric emergency, sorry, curriculum, work with faculty at Messina University to kind of train them in simulation, and then ultimately uh, support them to then run these cases for their medical students. Quickly, this shifted over to, to all virtual trainings, um, and it has developed a really uh, neat collaborative um, format. So at the end of this sort of so far, what we've got is all of our respondents of this training have felt that they are now more comfortable running their simulation cases and have found the training to be useful. Go to the next slide. So this is sort of what our initial plan was. So initially we had set out to have um, a series of sessions um, where we were running cases, um, initially the cases that kind of had come from Northwestern that had been developed um, here, and then kind of mentoring the, the Masano faculty um, through running cases and through debriefing cases with sort of deliberate practice. We were planning to meet sort of quarterly to do this, um, but based on sort of direct feedback from these sessions, on the faculty there felt that they wanted actually a lot more training and um, we actually shifted to monthly meetings or two hour meetings where faculty there was able to not only run the initial cases um, through sort of deliberate practice or quickly getting feedback and improving their techniques to now actually they've started developing their own cases. So the hypovolemic shot case that we ran in February was completely developed by uh, the faculty there. And we've now run it actually several times to sort of uh, work out some of the kinks on it. Um, and then the next case that they're working on will also be completely developed by them, which is a, a case on Burkitt's lymphoma. Um, additionally, so now that we're meeting sort of monthly, they've also been able to have the opportunity to do deliberate practice with medical students. So in the simulation lab uh, with sort of direct uh, feedback um, they're now actually practicing running cases with with students um, and able to sort of practice them in real time and and, and tweak their techniques um, all this sort of an accelerated timeline um, has probably pushed us up about six months from where we thought we'd be um, initially with sort of intermittent training but because um, the faculty there is sort of driving the the boat on on how frequently we meet and sort of what we're talking about when we're meeting at this point we're probably about six months ahead of schedule as far as of their ability to not run cases for their own students. Thank you. Yes, uh, exactly. And so we wanted to um, kind of sum up here our outcomes and our recommendations. And Dr. Fant put it perfectly. We developed very successful and robust partnerships at a distance and online. And all of our curriculum development, creation, and implementation has happened asynchronously and at a distance. Spaced repetition with our partners, longitudinal engagement, active learning techniques on both ends um, have occurred and a lot of learning has happened and everything is being led by our faculty. Systematic change was described both in um, the Luth project in terms of uh, collaborations across Nigeria and within a home institution, as well as systematic change developing trainers and learners uh, and teachers across both all of these institutions. Time has changed. So where we were going to travel for two weeks, now we have a real relationship that has sort of been built over two years. And it's rapid relationship building again with the same kind of urgency, but you're building it over time and not over trips. And as we describe this truly feels like a locally driven partnership. Our partners 
share their knowledge, they make their creative decisions. We spend a lot of time collaborating. And I think the shift is pretty nice. As Colleen described, it's mainly our partners are asking us to do more than we were planning. And then we have to pivot, shift and facilitate and make it happen. There's been a real change in funding and administration of money. So it's flow, you know, we've made the money flow away from travel more to effort of our local faculty, our local administrators, and sustained and, and, and spending money to sustain the building of expertise. These feel like more equitable relationships and time and power. Um, and it feels like I'm collaborating with a colleague in a home institution whose building just happens to be a little bit further away where we have our typical weekly meetings. In conclusion, I hope that you've seen how partnerships can be sustainable, have bilateral leadership, mutual benefit, and satisfy local needs and local ambitions through our presentation. We believe that this shows a way forward to more ethical and meaningful partnerships, um, and I hope that you do too. Great, thank you so much, Ashti and Colleen. Um, they will not be having a round table, but in the program, you will see their email addresses. So if you want to follow up with either of them um, after, the, after today's program, please feel free to reach out to them directly. Okay, so for our last, but definitely not least program of our hot topics part of the, um, of the morning, we are going to move over to uh, Melody Ryan and Pablo Blada Navarrete, who are presenting a, pre a hot topic called A Virtual Short-Term Experience in Global Health, Making Lemonade Out of Lemons. Hello, I'm Melody Ryan, and I'm from the University of Kentucky. And I am Pablo Boada from Ombro Ombro in Ecuador. We are excited to tell you about a pilot we made in one of our global health offerings in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. It really exemplifies the age old adage of when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Since 2007, the Centro de Salud Ombro Ombro has offered primary care services on the outskirts of Santo Domingo in Ecuador to low income patient populations. Santo Domingo is the fourth most populous city in Ecuador and has undergone immense growth since Ombro Ombro's inception. Its position between the largest cities in Ecuador, as well as the abundance of fruit farms, have been a great attraction for local and foreign immigrants. Even though Ecuador has a public healthcare system, it is often saturated, making it difficult for many citizens to access care. Ombro Ombro bridges the gap for at risk patient populations, namely elderly, pediatric, pregnant, and disabled patients. The COVID 19 pandemic has deepened the disparities that difficult the access to healthcare to the low income population. In 2005, faculty at the University of Kentucky, in conjunction with healthcare providers in Santo Domingo, Ecuador, undertook a community assessment in the neighborhood of Carlos Ruiz Bruneo. The community overwhelmingly supported opening a partnership health center. Child health needs were significant, with only 21% of children being current on their vaccines and 75% being anemic. In 2007, the Centro de Salud Ombro Ombro was opened in the community. In 2012, the Ombro Ombro Foundation was formed to operate the clinic and other programs in Ecuador. The Shoulder to Shoulder Global Program operates with representatives from all of the University of Kentucky healthcare colleges, students, and community partners. This group works as a liaison between UK and Ombro Ombro. Typically, Shoulder to Shoulder sends four week long short term healthcare experiences in global health to Santo Domingo throughout the year. The participants consist of healthcare professionals and students. It's a time when participants learn about care in middle income countries and about working together as an interprofessional team. Students across various education levels and healthcare foci have participated in these short-term global health experiences. In the semester prior to their travel, in order to prepare them to go, students must take an interprofessional course entitled Interprofessional Teamwork in Global Health. They learn about Ecuador, the determinants of health, interprofessional practice, and global health ethics. Unfortunately, COVID-19 prevented travel to Ecuador 
but leaders in shoulder to shoulder global start developing an alternative format for the brigade so that students could still experience interprofessional global health and the culture of Ecuador. At the same time, the pandemic pushed us to rethink manners to serve the local population and to create opportunities to continue offering global health learning opportunities. During the second week of August, six UK students joined nine Ecuadorian students for the first of its kind virtual short-term experience in global health to the Ombro Ombro Clinic. Students were provided a daily Zoom link and participated in the same sorts of activities that they would normally on an in-person short-term experience. In early January, we held a second virtual experience with six US students and 14 Ecuadorian students. So far, we've had students in communication and language disorders, diplomacy, medicine, pharmacy, physical therapy, and psychology. Included in the Ombro Ombro staff, the lead the brigade from Ecuador was the clinic's chief physician, the pharmacy coordinator, the community and social work coordinator, the community nurse, as well as translator to facilitate questions and discussions. In order to provide a better sense of the context of the community, several videos and interviews were prepared. Each day of the virtual experience had a set schedule that started with virtual patient consults with Ombro Ombro's chief physician, followed by a full day of activities and discussions that allow the students to compare and collaborate. Each day end with a short debriefing and reflection time. Each morning, the physician, Dr. Christian Carrion, performed patient consults that were selected to guide discussion around a theme for that day, such as nursing, medicine, physical therapy, pharmacy, and speech and language disorders. Before each case discussion, students practice presenting patients to the entire brigade. Discussion opportunities were more plentiful in the virtual experience and often more in-depth than the in-person experience. Here, students meet with Santo Domingo community leaders to discuss the challenges residents face daily and how the clinic helps to solve those issues. The leaders later mentioned they enjoy the opportunity to participate in those discussions. Conversations surrounding contemporary issues such as the impact of COVID-19 and changes in immigration policy were also incorporated in the virtual experience. Here, a professor from a university in Quito led discussion on the impact of COVID-19 on children's health in Ecuador. To extend and deepen the academic exchange was one of the achievements of this experience. Students were able to travel the streets of Santo Domingo through a pre-recorded city tour narrated by the program coordinator. Several activities began with a short pre-recorded video to provide the in-person feeling to the virtual experience and was followed by Zoom discussion time. Video footage from previous brigades were able to be translated and used for this global health experience. This allowed the students to encounter the Sachila culture of the indigenous population of Ecuador, which was followed by a discussion of the impact of COVID-19 on them. Sachilas are the indigenous people settled on the Santo Domingo area before the Spaniards arrived. They continue living on the west side of the city, experiencing the pressure of its growing. Students complete a cooking demonstration of a traditional Ecuadorian ceviche meal in conjunction with a discussion on nutritional healthcare in Ecuador. On the right, it's an image of a meal prepared by a student for his family post experience. Culture exchange has been a big component of the experience, which reinforces the context of the global health learning. In addition to the daily schedule, students had the opportunity to engage in a cultural buffet that furthered their virtual experience. Buffet items included practicing Spanish language, learning new cooking skills, encountering Ecuadorian performing arts, and exploring Ecuadorian tourist destinations, such as markets and the Galapagos. For the second brigade, we added a cultural buffet for the United States as well. Ecuadorian students were able to see tourism sites in Lexington, Kentucky, and see the wide variety of barbecue and pizza that we have in the United States. The class also curate, curated a Spotify video, Spotify playlist together um, as another way to form a bond. On the final day of the experience, a professional dance instructor led students through a salsa dancing lesson. Many students reported that the cultural components dispersed throughout the week helped create bonds with other students from different cultures or healthcare backgrounds. 
Comments from both the Ecuadorian and U.S. students were very positive for the first experience in August. For example, one said, now I have a good picture about the importance of interprofessional collaboration. Every profession has something to contribute to any case. The only real complaint, as you can see, was the amount of screen time. For the second short-term experience, we were able to offload any lecture material and reading to be completed asynchronously before the in-person experience began. As organizers, we also found that the students approached each other more as peers rather than visitors and interpreters. Many Ecuadorian students also stated that they learned new things about their own culture. One student said, the fact that most caught my attention is the magnitude of importance that the culture has in my country. Personally, I knew about many of these beliefs, but I never gave them the necessary importance since I did not believe in them. This helps me uh, with a better understanding of my society and makes me appreciate all the small details that I previously did not see. So I'm entirely grateful to have learned more about my culture and society. A US-based student commented that she has a disability that she thought would preclude her from ever being able to participate in education abroad. However, this virtual experience opened up that world for her. The staff of Bomber Bomber Clinic mentioned after the experience their satisfaction to participate in this interactive international learning experience. They reported an empowerment to teaching and academic experiences. Moving forward, Shoulder to Shoulder Global plans to return to Ecuador as soon as it is safe for our participants and the patients given the pandemic. However, with the very positive experiences that we have had, we plan to offer at least one virtual experience every year. It is a unique experience and opens the world of global health for students who cannot travel or who want to engage in a different type of global health experience. Great. Thanks so much to everybody. Um, so just to just to um, round out that that part of our session, um, uh, Melody and Pablo and their colleague Craig will be doing a roundtable in the um, next piece of our program. So if you want to learn more from them or ask questions about how they um, they put this together, please feel free to join them for that. Um, okay, so James, I'm going to kick it over to you. We were supposed to have 10 minutes for question and answer live, but we are also probably unsurprisingly running late uh, in our program. So um, what yeah. do you think? Yeah, I think, I think because we are running it late and because we are having a very uh, robust discussion in the chat, which is excellent, and I would invite people to keep doing that. We're having great questions pop in there. I do think that we are, we are going to pass over the live Q&A. My apologies about that. Uh, but there'll be more opportunities for some discussion and interaction with the speakers very shortly in the roundtables. It's um, 10.50 right now. So why don't we, <laughs> this is almost absurd, but like, why don't we take a brief five minute break? So if people need to refresh their coffee, you know, use the restroom, what have you, please go ahead. Uh, recognize that we're gonna come back and we're gonna sprint to the finish. We'll be done very punctually at 11. So I, I know it is a bit of a stretch, but I, I've really enjoyed the energy we've had from our speakers. We've got great energy going on in the chats. Uh, so five minute break. Uh, we're, in the meantime, we're gonna set up those breakout rooms. And as you come back, you can start sorting yourself into the different breakout rooms. Uh, where you can have a, a more uh, robust robust discussion in small groups. So thank you so, much so far. And then, uh, sorry, Tracy. Oh, yeah. One other thing to add just about the breakout rooms, because I've gotten some questions about it. So, um, so you will have the opportunity to choose which breakout room you want to go into. Um, they will not be recorded. So we are going to ask all of the hosts to, um, to designate somebody to take notes, and we will come back for a brief um, sort of group report back at the end. And so we will ask, you know, we won't have a lot of time for that. So we'll ask each group to pick one or two key points that were discussed in the round table that they would want to share with the entire group. So again, not going to be recorded, please take notes, and then um, and then ask somebody to serve as your reporter who will have one or two key points to share with the entire group. Um, and uh, yeah, so please uh, take a stretch, do whatever you need, take a break, and we'll see you back in just a few minutes. And apologies, Ijeoma, I'm just seeing a note from you in the chat um, offering to do some optional Q&A time if people didn't need a break. I know that you have to step off early. You're not going to be able to be part of the round table. So I think if folks have questions um, specifically for Ijeoma for that group, I think it would be fine um, if you wanted to. Um, uh, actually, I don't know that you guys have the option to unmute yourselves in this format. So if you wanted to put 
specific questions for Ijeoma in the chat, then maybe um, Ijeoma, we can have you respond, um, you know, using your voice instead of just typing in the chat. Absolutely, yeah, I can give a few minutes for that. I um, feel so bad that I can't be at the round, uh, round table. So I wanted to spend a couple of minutes answering any question live. I've put my email and my Twitter handle and IG handle, but I'm mostly active on Twitter for anyone to reach out to me. And then my colleagues in the round table will also share my contacts in case you have direct questions for me. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you have any questions, just, uh, yeah, I forgot you guys can unmute, put it in the chat, and I'm happy to take a couple of minutes before I jump off to respond. Sure, and I see just a note from James in the chat saying, you know, Ijeoma would love to have you reflect on Quentin's question on the impact of COVID-19 on global health colonialism. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, I was thinking about that as I listened to the other, to my colleagues that were, that, 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 uh, who were presenting earlier. And um, I was like, wow, I think, you know, even as uh, this pandemic exposed inequities uh, domestically and certainly globally, uh, it also, <laughs> I think, uh, helped to uh, uh, address those same inequities in a, in, a, in a few ways. One is that uh, now that people don't have to come necessarily, so there are some local uh, communities that may have developed a dependent uh, relationship with high income country institutions and in individuals and entities uh, providing services or providing substructure to that community that, uh, that those communities then are forced to look within and develop within uh, or, or at least provide uh, oppor opportunity for, for not just to develop because they, a lot of them already have internal indigenous uh, stru structures in place, but now to actually invest and build and strengthen those capacities because that uh, dependency relationship having been disrupted. So that's one thought. And then of course the virtual platform uh, taken outside of the digital inequities that are, that are in place for, but, but the, a large part of the world is very digitally uh, connected. Uh, I could tell you for Nigeria, where is, which is my country of origin, uh, the, you know, folks, we have market traders and farmers with three phones, <laughs> folks are connected. And so um, they, it provides this platform then for, for folks to, to, to get their voice out and voice heard and perspective heard, pers perspectives heard around a variety of topics through this virtual platform. So these are a couple of ways that I would lift up. Of course, there are many more, but uh, these are a couple of ways I would lift up that the pandemic has actually provided some solutions while simultaneously introducing problems in terms of global health colonial relationships. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ichioma. Um, I think in the interest of sort of not crunching the end part of the program, we should probably move on. As you said, you've put your email address and contact details in the chat, and I know that your colleagues will be um, will be doing a fantastic job with the roundtable as well. Um, so I think um, we have the breakout rooms are set. I know that not everybody's version of Zoom will allow you necessarily to choose um, to choose your own room. I'm gonna actually open up all the rooms at this point um, so that those who do have the ability to do that um, can start to select. I think if folks are not able to do it, if you wanna just put something in the chat to let me know where you want me to assign you, I'm happy to do that. Although there are 65 people on the call, so it might take me a few minutes to get through everybody. Um, and But just as a reminder, the titles of the round tables are there is the, um, the round table on the trainee advisory committee. There's the round table on the student and trainee global health interest survey. Um, there is one on virtual short-term experiences in global health. Uh, there's the one on decolonizing global health. Uh, there's protecting your global health partnerships. Um, the subcommittee on master's and undergraduate education um, will uh, global health degrees has a round table. The GME, uh, Graduate Medical Education and Global Health Working Group has a round table, and the Capacity Building Subcommittee um, has a round table. So there's a lot of places, a lot to choose from. Um, and just as a reminder, again, please take notes in your group um, and be ready to present one or two 
key, um, key items that you talked about when we come back together at the end. Emptied. I think we have pretty much everybody back at this point. So I hope that you had um, a great, we hope you had great conversations. I know that the time always, um, always goes by way too quickly, but hopefully you have the start of, of conversations that may continue after the conference. Um, noticing that there were some groups that had more people in them than other groups, we were going to focus on the groups that had sort of more, more people who joined to give the report back and then ask those who had fewer individuals um, whether they had anything that they wanted to add. So specifically, the groups that we're going to ask um, for the report backs are the, um, the virtual short-term experiences in global health, uh, decolonizing global health, the subcommittee on master's and undergraduate global health degrees, and then the GME and global health working group. And then, as I said, for the other groups, um, certainly there were, uh, you know, I'm sure that there were having, that you were having fantastic conversations as well. We just know that, that there were fewer of you. So if you have things that you want to share, we would love to hear um, from you as well. So, um, so let me start off with uh, the virtual short-term experiences in global health. So Melanie, Pablo, and Craig, um, who was the, um, the person who's willing to speak uh, for your group? I'm the journalist, um, Tracy. Thank you. So uh, just a, a few quick notes. Uh, there were some questions about how much time to spend virtually in a virtual program when you, when you have a bunch of students. And there was discussion to that. And some groups that had done something were limited to three hours per week. Uh, physical therapy at the University of Kentucky said uh, we should have no more than 50 minutes or so, and then you should have a five to 10 minute break. Um, students observed uh, during the virtual short term experience, um, but we did not provide care. That was, that was a question we were just observing. And then after the virtual experience, there would be a debriefing with the faculty. Um, the patients consented to the experience, uh, there was a group in Uganda that working with Uganda that had patient actors. And then there were other groups that had a consent form for patients agreeing to have students virtually in the room with them. There was a question about compensation and the economic, there are diverse sources of where the compensation for the work of the in-country staff, how are they compensated? And that comes from student fees and uh, various sources, including the clinic running full-time in-country. And the final piece was a question about cell service and bandwidth. Uh, when you're serving an indigenous population, how do you get around that? And there were several answers to that, included uh, pre-recording some of the sessions and then maybe, maybe having a question and answer session. Um, you can invite people to the question and answer session after a pre-recorded video is watched. So does that sum it up, Melody and Pablo, um, what, what you heard too? Okay. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, okay, so next, actually, let me throw it over to Carol and Catherine and the um, SMUDGE uh, subcommittee. Thanks, Tracy. We had a delightful conversation and we focused on a couple of things, but two of the primary areas that we were able to discuss was um, transforming definition of global health, especially at the master's level program. A lot of the emerging programs are highlighting the focus that's much more of an SDG type focus on global health. So it's not just international health elsewhere. It incorporates these essential um, explorations of global health domestically, both with specific populations within um, the domestic setting and also um, focusing on equity issues. Uh, secondary focus is thinking about articulation and what um, the growth in undergraduate master's programs um, has seen in uh, students that are arriving to medical schools with an interest in global health and the um, training and background is higher and greater and the expectations of the medical school programs is also higher, pushing on decolonizing curriculum, pushing on um, better community partnerships and program development. And those are, are forcing that um, those positive relationships, but also um, putting strains on some of the medical schools and the existing infrastructure. So two really interesting themes that we had the chance to explore. Wonderful. Thank you so much. 
Um, okay, moving along. So for the um, the GME and Global Health Working Group, Jenny, did you want to share or did you have a reporter for your group? Oh, Jenny, you can't unmute. Seth, would you be able to unmute Jenny Bainziger? Hey, everybody. Yes. Um, yes. So we had a great discussion. Um, a few of us have been meeting as a part of the curriculum for the last year, and then we had some great new voices. So we spent a little bit of time just debrief or kind of brainstorming what are seem to be some big barriers or the next things that we could work on to help our GME, like our resident level uh, learners in low middle in income countries, and I'll focus on those. Um, one, just increasing the bilateral exchange, trying to do everything we can to make sure that there are opportunities for them to rotate here, just like we spend lots of time and effort making sure our residents can go there. Um, the repositioning a one-way street paper by James, of course, last year has given us a good outline for that, but just thinking through next steps. Um, also, as we develop curricula for our global health residents here in the US, um, trying to think about how we can get more and more voices about purposely asking what do you, uh, from low and middle income countries, what do you want our residents to know before they come over? Um, and also just access to international meetings and conferences for residents and trainees as they are on their faculty development um, timeline. And we thought through some different barriers that make that difficult. Um, so still thinking through how, how we can be a part of helping address that. So. Wonderful. And I know, I mean, I know that your, your group has been working, as you said, over the last year, but always nice to have um, some new people joining in. So I'm glad that you were able to have that today at the, during the satellite. Um, and then sort of our last um, formal group that we're going to put on the spot is the Decolonizing Global Health. So who, um, who would volunteer to be the reporter for that group? Okay, Cat oh, Catalina, you can't unmute. Uh, Seth, would you be able to unmute Catalina Gonzalez Marquez? Should be getting a prompt to unmute. Yeah, just got it. Sorry. Um, I also wanted to, I didn't know if Ashti or Colleen or Tracy, who also had wonderful ideas, wanted to talk as well, but um, I did take some notes. We really structured our session to be more of just an open conversation. Because again, like the whole notion of decolonizing global health is really an individual reflection that then we hope will challenge power structures within institutions. Um, and also recognizing our own privilege that we all have in that most of us work in high income countries at powerful academic institutions and um, even having this conversation is such a privilege. Um, so we did ask some questions about, have you started to have these conversations at your own institutions? What have your experiences been? And, and we really just wanted to give people a safe space to talk about that. Um, you know, it seems like everyone's having some mixed experiences, um, but I do want to recognize that there seemed to be a consensus in that um, there's really a lot of power in the students, in the residents, in the junior faculty who are really bringing about this conversation um, and kind of all reflecting about how we can um, talk about that, but also a recognition of sometimes academic structures of promotion can be at odds with us really trying to challenge these notions of equity and, and parity. Um, and so kind of thinking thoughtfully about that. Um, and then also talking about how we would have these conversations with our own partners institutions. And, and a lot of us, you know, thinking about how we want to start having those conversations now and working towards recognizing where global health expertise really is um, and not where it seems to be concentrated now. And I don't know if anyone, I really would invite anyone else from the group to add to that. Sure, so if anybody else had an additional comment, you can just send a, a message in the chat so we can unmute you. Um, although as James said, in order to keep time for the rest of the program, we, we probably aren't gonna be able to have the other groups um, report back. Uh, okay, actually, though, um, 
So it sounds like the capacity building subcommittee had a couple of words just to, to share. So, um, so Andrew, are you able to unmute yourself or you, you need help with that? Seth, can you unmute um, Andrew Dykins? Should be getting a prompt for it. <clears throat> yeah, I'm on. Thanks, Tracy. I appreciate it. I just wanted to uh, uh, just uh, reiterate uh, our work with the capacity building database. We'd like to really encourage people to just go in and give this a try and spread it among your networks. So just a um, just a request to maybe take a look at that this weekend. The email, uh, the web-based email, uh, web-based address for that is cughcapacitybuilding.org. In order for this uh, grand vision to have an impact, we'll need as many people registering for this as possible and spreading among our, among our networks. That's all I have to say. I really appreciate the moment. Thanks. Thanks so much, Andrew. Okay, and I see James has just put some sort of follow-up things in the chat. We still do have you know, one last piece. We're gonna be talking about the CUGH um, portion of the um, USAID funded STAR project. Um, but just so that that folks are aware, you know, there is a follow up. Uh, there's a survey that brief, brief survey that we'd love you to take a look at so that we can um, get some feedback on how this was thinking ahead towards the future and what this satellite session will look like next year, um, as well as the um, the email address to join um, the global health education list um, for CUGH. And then James is just putting the, um, the program again in the chat, which has the contact information for all the folks who have presented um, this morning. Um, but in the interest of time, I think we do need to move on to the last part of our program. So let me just um, pull up those slides and we will get started. Okay. So I'm going to turn the um, the podium, the virtual podium, over to Philippe, um, Antonia, and uh, and David. Great, thank thank you, Tracy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for giving us the opportunity. Um, so I'm going to start off the presentation. Then Antonia Wolf is going to uh, continue, and then she'll be followed by Philippe Monfiston and. Um, then the then some members of the star committee uh, from CUGH I think will be presenting the bulk of the of this presentation. Um, so the star project uh, star stands for sustaining technical and analytic resources project is a five year project started in May 2018 it's funded by USAID. Yeah, I'll go ahead to the next slide. Um, and what we do is we. We source and we support global health expertise where it is needed, when it is needed. Uh, we do this by placing fellows and interns in global and local host organizations and by engaging partners with subject matter expertise to build capacity of local counterparts and institutions. And the reason we do this is to contribute towards positive impact on global health technical and systems areas. Next slide. Um, so we have interns in 27 countries in Africa and Asia, uh, plus in the United States and Washington, DC. We place fellows and interns in host organizations that include ministries of health, uh, USAID offices in Washington, as well as overseas USAID missions, in multilateral organizations. Uh, we would like to be able to place uh, fellows and interns in NGOs and academic institutions, but until now, we haven't been able to, to line that up. Um, our fellows are citizens of countries all over the world. They are local nationals um, who work in their own countries uh, many times, many of them in ministries of health, some at USAID offices. Um, some are our fellows who go from one, we place from one country into another uh, when expertise is needed and that's where we can source it. And then we have um, US nationals who work in Washington DC and a few who are placed overseas as well. They work in all sorts of content areas in global health, uh, from HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, maternal child health, nutrition. We have some new fellows uh, and interns who are working on COVID-19, family planning, reproductive health, and so forth. And then within those uh, specific categories, they work in um, various technical areas. So it could be things like data analysis and visualization, monitoring and evaluation, supply chain management, and, and many other 
types of uh, technical areas. We don't only work with individuals, interns and fellows, but we also sometimes are called upon to, um, to develop partnerships with organizations um, and institutions that can pr provide the expertise that's being called for. Um, so for example, right now we have um, you, uh, the University of California, San Francisco is we're working with them, um, supporting them to provide global technical assistance for COVID-19 related critical care. We are working with the uh, uh, with AMP Health, which is a, a program of the Aspen Institute to do some leadership and management capacity building in ministries of health. We um, are doing some diversity, equity, and inclusion work at USAID with the Office of HIV and AIDS in the Global Health Bureau. Uh, some organizational effectiveness work in India with the Packard Foundation grantee partners. And um, of course, what we're here to talk about today, we have our academic partnerships that, we, um, that we've been working with since the beginning of the project uh, with CUGH. Before I hand it over to Antonia, who uh, will talk more about that, um, next slide will just give you a quick picture of, uh, of where in the world we're working. We have quite a breadth of uh, opportunities to place fellows and develop partnerships and in many countries across across the globe. Um, and so now I'll just pass it on to Antonia, who will give you some more details. Thank you. Next slide, please. <clears throat> As David uh, mentioned, uh, part of the STAR project uh, was the academic partnership and knowledge management capacity building portion of the project. And uh, this part of the project was implemented jointly by PHI and CUGH. And it was definitely focusing on building strong academic partnerships and also strengthening their knowledge exchange and knowledge sharing systems. And what we had proposed uh, was to um, accomplish this through a small grants program called the Collaboration Library or what I'll refer to as the CoLab moving forward. Um, next slide. So in order to implement this collaboration laboratory, we wanted to determine what were the key components to what successful academic partnerships looked like. Um, we also wanted to do a uh, broad review of what uh, academic partnerships currently exist. And we wanted to ensure that we were identifying what gaps and constraints and opportunities there were, and we would, would, were focusing a little bit on USAID-based and uh, lower and middle income country-based academic institutions. And we knew that we needed to develop a tool to assess the partnerships. I'm gonna hand over the next slide to our colleague, Philippe. Next slide, please. Philippe, are you there? Um, I think he needs to be unmuted. Let's see. Seth, would you be able to unmute Philippe? I can prompt him to unmute, but since he's a co-host, he will have to hit the prompt or unmute himself. Hello, can let oh there he is. Great. Can you hear me now? Yep. Thank you, Antonia. So CUGH, in the interest of uh, practicing partnership at home, convened the STAR Committee as a way to have a on-call research resource. And below you see the three main products of the STAR Committee. The Comprehensive Review of Academic Partnerships was the first, and that initially began as a um, lit review, but then morphed into a more extensive analysis of existing partnerships and allowing us to understand what the landscape was as far as the, the current evidence base. And that was followed by the landscape analysis, which was more of a qualitative analysis of capacity needs, but more specific to health. And finally came the partnership assessment toolkit, which was a survey and a action plan that allows us to not only examine the indicators of successful partnerships and kind of measure the degree to which we saw that strength there, but then also uh, provide an action plan for improving 
where we saw difficulties in uh, forming partnerships along with some supplementary questions. And with the comprehensive review, there were four types of partnerships that were studied, for formal academic partnerships. And the first two were what fed into the collab where we had US institutions and LMICs partners uh, or uh, LMIC, LMIC partnerships. Great. Okay. So, um, so jumping ahead. So as Philippe mentioned, there were 24 um, CUGH members, largely from the education committee who volunteered to be part of this project, to be the CUGH star committee. Um, and, and actually I'll go back a slide. As he mentioned, there were three products that came out of, um, out of this committee's work. Um, and so um, I am representing the um, 23 other colleagues um, who worked together. We all worked together to develop these projects, um, products and wanted to just share a little bit about them with you because we felt that um, you know, the findings and, and the actual, you know, what these products in, in contain, these are things that um, are definitely of interest to the education committee more broadly. So I'm gonna start off with the comprehensive review of academic partnerships that Philippe mentioned. Um, what you can see up here in the corner, I have a QR code that if you aim the camera on your smartphone at that QR code, it'll take you directly to the link for um, this document online. At the end of the presentation, we are also gonna post um, the, the URL, the web address, where you can go directly to the, the partnership, but the address is a little bit um, clunky. So anyway, so the QR code is here. If you have your smartphone out and you wanna aim your camera at it, then it'll take you directly to the document. But again, the URL will be available uh, at the end. So just to put it up front, this is the, this is the list of 24 individuals who um, comprise the Comprehensive Review of Academic Partnerships Working Group portion of the committee, it was the entire committee. Um, and although I am here representing the group, um, I was really pleased that, um, that many of the folks on this committee were able to contribute to developing the slides for today's presentation as well. So, um, so as was mentioned, the comprehensive review of academic partnerships was designed to, um, to basically look at the existing literature and synthesize what we could to inform an understanding of formalized academic partnerships. And there were four types of partnerships that our group was looking at. Um, the first type was US-based academic institutions who partnered with LMIC-based academic institutions or North-South partnerships. Um, the second set was looking at uh, LMIC-based partners, so South-South collaborations. Uh, the third type was to look at um, academic institutions from anywhere in the world who partner with a local or international professional association or NGO. And then the fourth tarp type was academic institutions from anywhere who partnered with um, private or public sector actors. Now, you know, in terms of what do we mean by partnership, certainly there are lots of different ways this can be interpreted, but the specific inclusion criteria that we used for this review um, were the presence of a formal contract to define the relationship and common goal of the partnership. Um, the paired partnerships had to have been in existence for at least 12 months. Um, we were looking only at English language publications between December 2008 and December 2018. So certainly when you look at in the document, what were some of the limitations of this work? Uh, this is definitely a limitation, but this is what uh, this was the, the bounds of our um, of our study. Um, and then we were looking both in the academic as well as the gray literature. Um, so all in all, the, the final team ended up reviewing more than 100 documents in order to come up with this, uh, the conclusions. So the main research questions uh, were, there were four. So what are the reasons why partnerships emerge? Uh, what has worked well? Um, what are three to five measurable criteria that can be used to score or rate a partnership's impact and strength? And then fourth, what hasn't worked? Are there programmatic or systemic inhibitors or challenges to developing strong partnerships with institutions in LMICs? And if so, how can these be mitigated? So for the purpose of today's talk, I'm really just gonna focus on the what has worked well and give you a summary of that, and then what hasn't worked. Um, so in terms of key ingredients, um, so mutual benefit and respect, shared vision and goals, shared leadership, uh, having uh, governance and communication structures in place, 
uh, clarity of roles and responsibilities, stakeholder engagement at all levels of the partnership, uh, bilateral staff and administrative support, joint activities with local community involvement. Um, additionally, there was a sort of a series of findings related to having a focus on long-term commitment and sustainability. So thinking about how is this partnership strengthening local capacity? Um, are your funding sources diversified such that the loss of one is not going to completely topple the partnership itself? Um, flexibility, which comes as no surprise to this audience. Um, and then regular monitoring and evaluation of the partnership. Um, then specifically for for partnerships that are engaged in research, having um, shared publications and you know, authorship is certainly something that has, um, has come up um, in, in the literature talking about who was first, who is last author, uh, what do those positions mean? But even just having publications where you've got authors from both sides of the partnership is key. Um, and then shared access to data sets. Um, for educational partnerships, one other additional finding um, was having a bi-directional scientific and cultural exchange of faculty and students. Um, so now I realize that, you know, for this audience in general, and then certainly based on what has already been discussed this morning, none of these things are brand new shocking ideas. This is not rocket science, but it is nice to be able to say we, we looked through the literature. These are the things that have been documented over and over again as key ingredients to successful partnerships. Um, and you know, I like this quote at the end. So it's clear that there's no one one element is more that's more important than another. The crux is to maintain an environment based on mutuality and equity. Um, now flipping over to some of the challenges, the programmatic or systemic inhibitors and challenges. So these are sort of the four main buckets, um, but to flesh them out a little bit. So you know, funding came up over and over again. Um, this related to sort of a dependence on U.S. partners for funding. Uh, limited duration of funding, and then just the, the impact of funding on sustainability, which sort of gets to the, the comment I made on the earlier slide about having a diverse set of, of funding sources for your program. Um, cultural differences certainly came up, as well as sort of political, social, linguistic, and contextual differences, none of which are insurmountable, but they certainly are things that need to be recognized and, and sort of put out in the open and then negotiated around. Um, as far as health system issues, um, partnerships that led to duplication of services, this was certainly a, a challenge uh, um, that was reported on. Um, and then there are a whole host of issues related to partnership dynamics. And so those ranged from the interpersonal, where you had lack of role or priority clarity, uh, lack of trust among individuals running the partnership, or poor communication in general. Um, and then between partner institutions, so a failure to attend to capacity building, uh, lack of awareness of partner needs and challenges, individual career building, focusing on that as opposed to institutional strengthening, and then, um, and then also competition amongst players. Um, so again, none of this is shocking to this audience, I'm sure, but just helpful to see this all sort of collated and spelled out. Um, and so the, the team uh, came up with a set of best practice recommendations, and I will just put these up here. Um, so having a comprehensive agreement document, like a memorandum of understanding to lay out, you know, the priorities and the roles and responsibilities. Um, the third point was to ensure effective communication and continual engagement, commitment to shared goals, um, having a bi-directional reciprocal relationship, and then flexibility, flexibility, flexibility. Um, a long-term commitment to partnership, uh, mutual respect and trust, robust monitoring and evaluation, and importantly, learning from those evaluations, um, community involvement. Uh, there was a point that early successes are helpful. So if the team can sort of develop a program together, publish a paper together early on, then there is this track record of having a success, which is something that, um, that can, can really help give the team more confidence about working together moving forward. Um, and then incorporation of capacity building efforts as well. Okay. So I'm gonna move on to the second product, which was the capacity landscape analysis. So again, as with the last slide, I have a QR code here, which is gonna take you directly to the document. So if you wanna pull out your smartphone and take a picture, um, you can do that or the URL will be at the end. Um, and here is the list of individuals who participated specifically in the capacity landscape analysis working group. Now, the, um, 
the landscape analysis was a survey. Uh, so the goal of this was to try to better understand the capacity needs of academic institutions based both in the US and LMIC with respect to global health engagement. And so this survey was conducted over a two week period in summer of 2019 um, and was sent, uh, or the respondents um, were um, individuals from both US and L LMIC, from they were academic administrators, faculty and staff who were engaged in global health, global public health, and or global partnerships for health. Um, there were 117 respondents and you can see the um, sort of the balance of the breakdown or the unbalance of the breakdown of respondents here. 61% um, of them uh, represented public institutions versus private, private. institutions. Um, there was uh, equal representation from um, both medical and public and community health disciplines. Um, and there were some respondents from nursing, pharmacy, and the humanities and other disciplines, but a much smaller number. Um, and the majority of respondents were engaged both in global health research and education. Um, so out of this analysis, um, so came a list of priority areas for strengthening global health um, programs and activities, and then a list of existing constraints for addressing priorities. Um, so the priority areas here, across all groups really were a focus on education, wanting education, and specifically for folks who were from LMIC institutions, wanting help with uh, workforce development and other types of training, um, wanting to strengthen partnerships and, and collaborations that they had with other institutions, um, certainly gaining more funding, access to funding, and then engagement in research. Now, in terms of constraints that the participants found, um, so these were some of the issues they brought up. So again, funding, um, and that there are a lot of things that sort of people in the um, in the free text answer uh, answers uh, section that they listed that sort of all fell under the bucket of funding. But importantly, protected time uh, was one piece, and that goes for both U.S. and LMIC respondents. Um, the second point was the need for funded travel, um, and I think you know we've also talked a lot this morning about how COVID has impacted perceptions of the need to actually travel in order to have strong partnerships. But again, this was a pre-COVID survey. Um, and then other constraints sort of fell under the bucket of bureaucracy. And there were a lot of things that, that um, were noted here, including sort of a lack of support from, um, from your institutional leadership, a lack of recognition that your global health activities were uh, important to the institution and were valid. Um, now, as far as sort of institutional needs that were identified that could help enhance capacity to apply for U.S. government development funds. Now, again, this was funded um, by USAID, so that was part of the reason for looking at this. Um, respondents wanted um, or wished that they had additional dedica or, and dedicated time to work on um, fundraising uh, grant applications, uh, wished that they had resources to help them with that and technical skills to even explore what opportunities might exist. Um, and then importantly, both US and LMIC respondents said that, that the grant application process itself was challenging. Um, so I think that was something that was interesting to hear, that that was coming from folks um, all around the world. Um, in terms of what the perceived needs were um, to help enhance capacity to partner with other institutions, so funding to attend conferences and workshops and engage in in-person networking. This was, you know, I think this was the number one on the list. And it would be interesting to repeat this kind of question now and see what people's perceptions are given, uh, given Zoom platforms and how we've all adjusted in the setting of COVID. Um, folks asked for um, uh, sort of enhanced capacity um, around strengthening partnership related technical and administrative skills. And then again, looking to their institutional leadership to really help uh, to prioritize partnership building. It's really hard um, when you're leading from the bottom up in terms of building partnerships. Okay, so I'm just gonna switch over to the third um, and final product that came out of this project. Again, the QR code is here, so please feel free to, um, to take a picture here. So this is the Partnership Assessment Toolkit uh, and it's the companion document. Um, and here is the working group that worked, that uh, collaborated together to develop the, the PET. Um, so the, the goal of the PET, as, as Philippe had mentioned, was to guide institutions through their own self-assessment to evaluate strengths and challenges within their partnership. 
Um, importantly, elements of this came from the comprehensive review of academic partnerships. So that was, you know, the, that part was completed first, and then we were able to take um, lessons from that, as well as existing partnership assessment tools. Um, it was, it is organized according to um, a well-known uh, model, the Bergen model of collaborative functioning, and also incorporates USAID collaborating, learning, and adapting framework, the CLA framework, uh, which helps guide institutions on how to, how to be better learning uh, institutions, how to learn from their experiences. Um, and the questionnaire itself, the assessment is divided into three sections. So the first part focuses on sort of inputs or partnership foundations. So what are the mission, what's the mission of your partnership? What are the resources? And importantly, what are the financial resources as well? Um, the second part of the questionnaire looks at the function of the partnership or throughputs. Um, so how does the leadership function? What is the communication like? What are the roles and structures? Um, and what, what are sort of the interactions? And then the third part, the outputs of the partnership, really looks at sort of, you know, can they be classified as synergistic, antagonistic, or, or additive? So synergistic would mean that sort of the cost, um, you know, the cost that both partners are putting in um, leads to outcomes that actually are, you know, far exceed um, the expense, you know, whether that's financial or otherwise, of what's being put in. Antagonist means that the cost, you know, what the product is of the partnership does not justify the cost input. And then additive simply means that, you know, you put in this and, and I'll put in this and, and the expected product is, um, you know, is sort of what we expect. So synergistic is sort of is, is what we're all aiming for. Um, and importantly, as was mentioned earlier, the toolkit contains a discussion guide for partnerships and an action plan template. And that's, that's sort of the point. It's one thing to do this assessment, but the whole goal of the assessment is to then guide the conversation that are gonna help you look at areas to grow um, and, and move forward from there. Um, so as I mentioned, there are a couple of URLs that would be useful for folks. So there's the, the website for the STAR product, the uh, STAR project, the ghstar.org. CUGH had released a couple of these products on their blog. Um, and then, then here's the URLs for the three um, products themselves. And I should say, you know, this satellite is being um, recorded, so you don't don't worry about having to write all these things down. You could certainly find them later when on the recording. And I'm going to turn it over to David. Actually, um, it's going to be me and Philippe Tracy on this slide. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so yeah, I think we're we're we're, we're tight for time. So I'll, I'll go through this as quickly as possible. Uh, possible and Philippe is going to help too. Um, I think we already mentioned that the small grants were uh, $15,000 per, per partnership, um, and the only stipulation we had on those is that uh, the LMIC partnering institution did not get less than half, so they could either get half and half, or they were able to have a larger port of that, portion of that budget between the partnership. Um, as Tracy mentioned, the once we ha were up and going, COVID came, and it had many delays and challenges on, on carrying out the collab. Um, and in order to make it uh, based on the feedback that we got from the comprehensive view and the landscape analysis, uh, we tried to make the, um, the submission or the application as easy as possible. In fact, uh, we tried to keep it down to literally one page um, so that it was uh, user friendly and easy to easy, easily accessible. And then we had our, our four partnerships and the first partnership between Kenyatta and Valley View they were unpaired, so they submitted their applications uh, uh, alone, independently, and we went ahead and we partnered them through the partnership, and then they had to, I think two weeks, they had to come up with a joint MOU, so it was a really neat experience for both of those universities. The other three partners had all partnered already together and had been working together, so we just extended or gave them a new, um, um, new, uh, thing to, to work on together. Um, and as um, Tracy said, with the partnership assessment toolkit, we used the three parts as the baseline, midline, and endline assessments in which we did throughout the course of the year in what we called learning exchanges. So we had the first learning exchange, we did the baseline, we had the second, which was the midline, the third, which was the endline. And um, we additionally, just so, so you know, we developed a capacity assessment toolkit, which focused on knowledge management. And we actually did those to each and every one of the eight 
um, par uh, partnerships in order to build the capacity around knowledge management. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to Philippe, who's going to talk a little bit more about the actual partners. Hello. I can hear you. Great. Thank you, Antonia. Uh, so in terms of the specific projects between Kenyatta and, and Valley View, they decided to uh, work on a tool that would evaluate each other's infectious disease curricula. In the case of Kenyatta, they decided to um, implement a completely new or design a completely new curriculum. And in, a, in an odd way, the COVID pandemic uh, provided them with a new segment that they hoped to incorporate into their curriculum. Uh, with Valley View, they already had an existing uh, curriculum. And so the idea was that Kenyatta would then apply the tool that they co-developed to evaluate that. And so um, as of the time of my participation, I did not see a final product. They did uh, submit drafts and we were able to connect them with technical assistance to help them refine that tool. Uh, but I think especially going forward, this is something that the committee and, and larger network would like to um, perhaps reach out to them over their work. Uh, with Notre Dame and Uganda Martyrs University, their project was specifically around how to improve the uh, research infrastructure and the service delivery around palliative care in Uganda. And along with Kathmandu University and MCW, uh, they had the distinction of having manuscripts accepted by global health journals. So I think in terms of the deliveries that we articulated with them when we first had the orientations, they really lived up to the expectations as far as the diversity of products that could come out of, of their partnerships. With MCW and, and KUSMS in, in Kathmandu, they were working around developing uh, health protocols for their hospitals' respective emergency departments. And in for Kathmandu specifically, that also included special uh, training curricula in uh, using mannequins for, for simulations. Uh, so, and in terms of pivoting due to COVID as well, they were a special case where they had originally picked eight topics uh, covering different, different conditions from COPD to, to pediatrics, uh, but they decided to swap one of those protocols out for COVID, uh, which formed the basis of, of one of their manuscripts. And I think especially having been designed in an LMIC setting, that's, that's something that could greatly benefit researchers across the board. With Turo and the University of St. Francis Xavier, their primary goal was to set up an IRB for uh, the University of St. Francis Xavier in, in Bolivia and um, actually had a poster submitted for, for this conference. Um, even though in, in the case of KUSMS and, and Turo or uh, USFX, these were primarily benefiting the uh, LMIC countries, in the case of uh, you know, Turo, I think the goal for them was to also be able to have a partner that they could conduct research with in that region uh, and not have to necessarily uh, outsource the task of, of IRB approval. And so with the, with the learning exchanges, we use the PAT and, and the CAD, and as we said, they were uh, greatly informed by the comprehensive review. The CAT was more focused on knowledge management. So that was more of the academic partnerships team. But what we wanted to incorporate in learning exchanges was a segment that we called what donors can learn from you. And so while we already understand that it's important for partnerships to be bi-directional and, and mutual, uh, we didn't want there to be the sense that it was primarily how the academic partners could learn from donors and, and just have it be in, in that direction. We wanted it, even though the donors would not be in the room, so to speak, we wanted to have the partners uh, be able to present to them and kind of articulate their concerns, their uh, sources of pride and, and what they considered their assets and strengths to be, uh, and also what was unique about their, their specific contexts. And maybe I could just add for the very last point that we are, um, we have a draft of the CoLab final report and it is being finalized and is, will be disseminated soon. Great. So thanks 
Um, thanks so much uh, to David and Antonia and Philippe um, and the other members of the CUGH Star Working Group um, for, for all of that work. I hope that you will take a look at those products um, because I think they're very, there's a lot to learn for all of us from, um, from what has been gathered. I know that we are already over time. So James, let me turn it over to you for some final words. Yeah, I just want to thank once more everybody. Indeed, we are right at the minute, so I think we're going to round up. But um, if you people have final questions, feel free to put them in the chat, or you can email people as well. Um, I just want to thank once more all of our speakers through the day. We had a really great um, set of speakers. I was really pleased to see the chat humming throughout. So I appreciate to the participants, people kind of having the engagement. You know, it's always tough to know with virtual stuff how engaged we're going to feel. I'm feeling very excited, very energized, and I really kind of put that very much at the feet of everybody who um, was kind of acting there, throwing in more links, all the rest. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't also thank our other two kind of co-organizers, Virginia and Barbara, of help kind of think through the overall structure of this day. Um, and then very much thanks to our CUGH support, um, particularly like uh, Jenna and the law have done a lot of work with us to kind of help the day get set up, working with Confex and all the rest. And then finally, thanks also to Seth, who has given us some very capable technical support throughout the course of this morning. So I think with that, we have only one minute left in this room. So I'm going to go ahead and say thank you, everybody. Um, I'm glad to have an excuse to put on a suit for the first time in about a year. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to repeat this experience maybe in person in the years to come. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone so much. Uh, do go to more of the CUGH satellites and to the main conference if you can. And we'll look forward to seeing you uh, in all sorts of formats in the months and years to come. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care. Have a great rest of your Saturday.